this week's episode of Creepscast is sponsored by Coinbase. For a limited time, new users can get $10 in free Bitcoin when you sign up today at coinbase.com slash mrcreeps. And Green Chef. Go to greenchef.com slash mrcreeps130 and use code mrcreeps130 to get $130 off plus free shipping. Hello everyone, I hope that you're all doing well. We have a jam-packed show this week with a ton of your favorite scary stories. Let's get into it as we drift further into Mr. Creep's mind. If your radio makes strange sounds, it's best to ignore it. Written by Real Dale. Silver eyes in the dark. The image is burned into my brain. I'll give you my real name. Brian Matthews. It's not like you can find me anyway. You don't have time. The nurses that shuffle in and out of my room tell me that they just want me to be comfortable. The doctor tells me the proton therapy didn't work. The mass has metastasized. They've never seen anything like it. It took it 26 years to take me, but it finally has. They tell me I can't leave. I've tried, but I'm too weak to get up and walk to the bathroom. I don't think I'll be going anywhere. Before the big day, I need to share something. I never told anyone about this. Nobody. If you ever pick up a stray radio signal, don't let curiosity get the best of you. Just let it go. Turn your radio off and go on with your life. You never know how it can change you. It's 1996. Tucumcari, New Mexico is desolation made flesh. It was like someone tossed a few buildings and a road out on the map and moved on to better places. By this time, I had been a mechanic at a little shop for three years. I kept to my business and I went to work and went home. Didn't really socialize. This was a pretty good setup for me. I'm just not really a people person. The desert is quiet. No people. I could ride my old dirt bike out there. Put a mesa or two between me and the highway. The only sound there is is nature. As you crouch to look at a bug or a cactus... You get the feeling that no other man has stepped here before. The way that it was before a pre-modern man had even stepped foot here. The sounds are natural. Sounds of the earth. The rustle of the mesquite. Tiny animals skittering across the sand. Dust unsettled by wind. You can see 60 miles in any direction. Only sparse plateaus to block your view. That day, I watched a hulking purple thunderhead form in the way of distance, lightning sparking around its periphery. The thunderhead had moved east away from the sun and toward the north. I stood atop the mountain. Tukumkari Mountain wasn't the biggest, but it was fine for my purpose. My battery-powered radio squawked on the ground as I pointed to the homemade directional antenna around. Listening. Nothing but static. I sighed. There isn't much to listen to out here. Just an old country channel, some evangelical station, and lots of Spanish music. The Spanish top hits were played out by now, and I was looking for something new. The Walmart that I shopped at was in Clovis. The grocery store in town was way too expensive. About 90 minutes southeast. Most of the drive, I either threw in a cassette or scanned through these stations, looking for something, anything but country or Spanish music. Sometimes, I would get a whiff of a certain rock station, depending on the weather. At just the right mile marker, I could tune to that channel and rock for a couple of miles. It was a short-term companion, though. There for a while, and then on to the next lonely driver. But I hadn't gone to the mountain to find Pearl Jam or Weezer. I was searching. 
I was on my bi-weekly trip to get groceries. I had worn out my Eagles and Greatest Hits tape and I was looking for something new. The radio was tuned to 105.1, trying to catch that rock station again. I still wasn't quite in range yet. I started to hear something coming through the static. That was weird. I had never heard anything out there before. It grew more clear. Some strange ambient mix. Out of rhythm. Humming and wavering tones undulating like whale songs. Distortion of some kind. I tuned to a different channel. That same odd, patternless ambience was playing. I kept tuning. Every channel was playing it. I said screw it. And I popped in the Eagles tape again. I hit play. The ambience was there again. I tuned up the radio listening for patterns in the sounds. There weren't any. But I could distinguish 10 or 11 distinct voices. All overlapping and changing. Pitch and tone at odd intervals. It must have been magnetic interference. Something strong. Maybe a government secret underground project or something. I was about to turn the radio off, but something stirred within me. Something lonesome and primordial. The odd pattern the sounds became music. Abyssal walls from a place deep and bottomless. It buried itself in my mind. The desolation and the sound. I felt myself drifting. It was a song now. Patterns emerged, intricate and beautiful. But there was a hunger there too, hidden deep within. Not only could I hear them, but I could feel them. Like another sense I had just acquired. I could feel them pass through me. And when they did, I could feel their texture, their weight and their sharpness. We really didn't know the universe around us. Not at all. Sure, we can touch, smell, stuff like that. But the universe can experience itself in an infinite number of ways. And that day I was expanded, realizing I was not free. I was locked in this body, stuck in it. A meat casket and I, the real I, was writhing within. Little sparks in the meat of my head. Nothing more. I wanted to get out. To leave this useless meat behind. And then the music stopped. Leaving only static in its wake. I turned around, crossing the medium immediately. Flattening the dry yellow grass that grew there. I drove up and down that highway until nightfall. I just searched. I would have done anything to get that feeling back. I can't describe it, but it was like losing a limb or becoming blind all of a sudden. I didn't even get groceries that night. There was a hole in my skull where that feeling had been. It throbbed and ate like torn flesh. I slept on the side of that road. Waking up in fits, wondering where the music had gone. Oscillating between furious anger that the song had left and pathetic sobbing fits. I felt the hole every day since then. When I worked, when I ate, and when I slept. I even feel it now the way someone feels about a long dead relative. I continued my search for a month. Driving out on that highway every day. Every day I came home empty handed. I couldn't eat. I couldn't sleep. All I could think about was getting that feeling back. This cosmic numbness couldn't be all there was. The grief lasted for another three months. I stopped doing things that I enjoyed. I didn't even turn on the TV when I got home. I lost 30 pounds. I just couldn't make myself eat. I no longer went searching for the station. I swore off the radio entirely. I couldn't avoid the road so when I passed the section where I had heard the song, I would breathe slowly and ignore the compulsion to turn the dial. At some point I decided that I didn't need it. It wasn't even real. The whole thing had been some hallucination, delusion, magnetic frequency that had altered my brain. One day, the feeling spell completely worn off. I realized that I had never felt that way about a song. 
Never has a song set me reeling, changing the trajectory of my entire life the way that a long-term relationship ending would. The past few months had been a cloud of despair and anger. It's still hazy now. I got my crap together. What the heck had gone on? When I thought of the song now, it was patternless and powerless. The great, rapturous emotions that I had weren't even embers anymore. That's when my real search had started. From the mountain, I could see forever. A patchwork of yellow and green. I could see the nearby lake and the town itself. But best of all, I could see I-40. Miles and miles of it. I had pointed my antenna around a while. I would find him or her even if I had to stay up here all night. I had figured some things out since my reawakening. The station wasn't in a fixed location. If it was, I should have been able to pick it up in my car on that little stretch of highway. Either that or the station had been taken down. I hoped that it wasn't the latter. I heard about the story of a community who was at televisions that periodically would be hijacked. A strange image and voice would come on and rant and rave about whatever. Always late at night. Stories start to spread at HOA meetings, barbecues, churches. People start realizing that they have all seen this thing on TV. The image was a big white triangle on a black screen. The mark of the devil, the hijacker claimed. Some people start looking out for it at night and they find it. The whole town goes in a panic. Some think that the devil is coming. Some think that it's UFOs. Others believe it's a killer roaming a ton to hijacking signals. They're taking to the streets. The sheriff has to get control over his town. So he mobilizes the deputies, uh, all three of them. It takes no time at all for them to catch the culprit. Sitting in a Wendy's parking lot, frosty in hand when they arrest him. It turns out that it's some crazy guy who drives around all night using his mobile amateur broadcast setup to take over people's TVs. Somebody must be driving around broadcasting that insane music. The same as that crazy guy. I really hope that I was on the money. I follow the snaking shape of the interstate with the antenna again. Static. The night wore on with no updates. Not so much as a shift in the static. I could see tiny headlights gliding down the tiny interstate, making their way to their tiny destinations. I started to think that I wasn't going to find anything tonight. I stood up and I grabbed the antenna. I rolled the cord up around the radio. Started to unplug it when I heard the static change slightly. I unrolled the antenna slowly and pointed it at the interstate. Sure enough, there was a very faint signal. I tempered my expectations. It was very, very, very unlikely that I would find it on my first night. I got close to the speakers. There was something lost in all that static. I put my ear to the speakers. Very faint, almost imperceptible, but it was the song for sure. All at once, the static resolved and the blast of sound almost sent me rolling down the side of the mountain. I caught myself, snatched the volume knob and turned the sound off. I crammed in the earplugs that I brought. I turned the volume back up, put my hand over the radio. I could feel the warbling pattern and the vibrations. I pointed the antenna away from the interstate. The vibrations lost rhythm, static. I pointed it back at the interstate. The vibrations returned to their previous state. Jesus H. Christ, I'd found it. I almost died getting down the mountain. I hopped onto my dirt bike at the fence and just outside the entrance to the mountain and I kicked rocks. The bike isn't strictly street legal, but I didn't care. I must have looked like a straight up knot. A guy on a dirt bike and no helmet, weaving around cars at breakneck speeds, a radio between his thighs, his right hand firmly pressed to the speaker. Now the signal was steady. There were only a few cars in the road that night. I had passed the last one maybe five miles back. 
Up ahead in the distance, I saw shimmering taillights. Two red eyes in the dark. This signal had been steady for a few miles now. No real way to tell if that was the car or not. So I slowed down and put a mile between the car and I. The signal did fade slightly. F it, I thought. I pulled up in the car, getting in behind it. In my tiny headlight beam, I could see that it was a Chevy truck. An 80s model with the beveled tailgate and the chunky square front. But it was a single cab. Only enough room for a single seat. Nowhere to put a bunch of radio equipment. No antenna on top. Another strange thing was that I could not see through the back windshield. Usually, even if it's tinted, you can see something. It was just a void up there. I followed for a distance, but the station never lost signal. I took the chance. I was braver by far back then. I hadn't yet learned the depths the world had. Those dark corners, cracks and crevices were hideous shadows hide. I got up beside the truck and looked in the window. It was also completely black, opaque even. I looked at the windshield. It didn't even shine like glass should. It was like someone had spray painted it. And by this point, the driver should have been pretty tripped out. But the truck kept on at the same speed, perfectly in between the lines. And the right blinker came on. I could see an exit ramp coming up. The window cracked open and a pale hand had emerged. It gestured for me to follow. I did. We ended up on a dusty country road far away from civilization. The sweat from my palms made the accelerator slippery. When we got to a railroad crossing and the truck had just stopped, dust whipping around it. We sat there for a long moment. I was waiting on the driver to get out. They didn't. I got off my bike and started forward toward the truck, palms dripping in sweat. My tongue smashed up against my teeth. I made a wide arc, keeping some distance between me and the truck. I stopped. Nothing happened, and the truck just sat there. Is anybody in there? I yelled. Stupid question, but what else was I supposed to ask? I took out one of my earplugs. The radio just played static. I wondered if I had lost the signal and now I was just facing down some random driver. The driver door popped open like a can of sardines. Just enough that a thin line of red light escaped from within projecting onto the dirt. I was breathing hard now. I wanted to just hop on my bike and get the heck out of there. But I didn't. Instead, I approached the door. I grabbed the edge and I pulled it open. Some things about the world are best left to those dark corners. I know that now. I can't even accurately describe the contents of the car. The memories are somehow fragmented, like a torn up picture. I remember the smell, like a thousand year old jockstrap and all that junk mingled together. It seemed to waft out onto the ground, heavier than the air around it. I had thought that the guy had a mobile station set up in that truck. That was partly true. At first, he was facing the road. By this point, I had fallen back on the dirt, my elbows locked holding me up. And then he turned to me, over the years, I've been able to piece this memory back together. But even now, when I recall him, my body shudders uncontrollably. My lizard brain tells my body that we are in danger. My throat gets dry. I stand and pace. The eyes. Gray and mirror shiny in their sockets, like two ball bearings. Red veins crawled up from the socket and paused somehow feeding those metal balls. A metal loop antenna was sunk halfway into the back of his head. Only a crescent shape was visible because the rest was inside him somehow. 
The same red veins crawled up the metal of the antenna. The metal throbbed like real tissue at the junctions between it and the flash. The cab light was covered in those veins, casting a red light out into the night. A voice came from my right, from my dirt bike. Chosen, a voice said. The manner of things teeth chattered in tune with the voice of the radio. I remember wondering what it was. It answered the question in my head. Conduit, it said. You've heard them now, whispering in their infant sleep. They writhe and moan in the stars. I transmit. You come, it said. The rest is like when you go under for surgery and people tell you the funny things you said when you woke up. I woke up in the ditch, some guy yelling at me. The hospital gave me fluids. I had been out there for three days before someone found my dirt bike and then me. The bike had started to grow a strange red vine-like material on the crankcase and any part of it that was metal. I left it there. I was never comfortable around radios since then. I learned everything I could about them just so I would know how to avoid the waves. Something about the idea of waves traveling through me at all times caused my skin to crawl. Since then, I've left New Mexico and I moved up to Colorado. Never got married. Being a terminal shut-in will do that. I pulled out the antenna on my Wi-Fi router and only use Ethernet with a cord on the little desktop that I could afford. I turned on my mobile data just for this post. I'll be turning it off for good once I'm done. They won't let me leave. All they can do is make me comfortable. Not long now, they say between doses of morphine, a mass is growing inside of me. They can't figure out what it is, but I'm too far gone at this point. I can feel it crawling inside of me. Red vines strangling at my every organ. I dream of writhing things. A mass of slippery eel bodies. Hammer-shaped heads and tiny prenatal lambs. They were awash in brilliant purples and blues and glittering yellow mist. Their bodies covered in red veins pulsing. They sing the song constantly. The closer that I get to death's door, the more frantic their singing becomes. Star-shaped eyes, slitted pupils. They look at me and they salivate. My God, the way they look at me. They don't see me. They see my soul. And I see it too. Slowly turning red. I would like to take a moment to thank this week's sponsor, Coinbase. Have you found yourself curious about cryptocurrency but ended up feeling a bit overwhelmed with all the questions surrounding it? I was in the same boat myself. But Coinbase makes learning to buy and sell crypto easier and simpler than ever. While cryptocurrency used to feel like a sort of secret or exclusive club, at least in my eyes, Coinbase helped me realize that pretty much anyone could get their foot in the door without much effort at all. I've always been set on diversifying my financial portfolio and making sure that I don't have all my eggs in the same basket. Cryptocurrency felt like that next logical step to me, and I'm really glad that I took the plunge. And best of all, Coinbase offers a highly trusted and easy-to-use platform for buying, selling, and spending cryptocurrency. For a limited time, new users can get $10 in free Bitcoin when you sign up today at Coinbase.com slash MrCreebs. Sign up at Coinbase.com slash MrCreebs for $10 in free Bitcoin. This offer is for a limited time only, so be sure to sign up today. That's Coinbase.com slash MrCreebs. If you go trespassing in Detroit, stay out of the trees. Written by Annie Marie Morgan 
my third time going to Detroit, I felt confident enough to try and find new places to explore. The first time there, I only went to these saved, touristy buildings that every other urban explorer visits. The zoo on Belle Isle, the Packard plant, the Fisher building. My second time there, I went to some more obscure places that I found on various urbex blogs and Instagram accounts. I found an old theater, an abandoned church, and a barely held together power station in the woods. On the third visit, I was going with Tony, a guy that I had met through Instagram, who was even more of a seasoned explorer than I was. He had gone to Gary, Indiana, and bribed the cops to let him explore, which I always thought was just an urban legend. Since I had been to Detroit twice before, I was feeling cocky, and I floated the idea to Tony that we should go there and scout out new places that hadn't been hit by everybody else already. I said we should just go in blind and explore and see what we could find. Part of the perk to going to the places that everyone on Instagram visits is that you know they're relatively safe, because hipsters are always there taking pictures. So our idea did come with some risks. We brought mag lights and mace, just in case. I didn't have Snapchat, but Tony also said that he had turned down his location sharing thing, and he would have his girlfriend keep an eye on it if we didn't check in for a while. With that, we felt like we had taken all these safety precautions that we had to. That's part of the problem with urban exploration. The people who are doing it are all people who have never really run into anything dangerous so you get a false sense of security. You'll never team up with someone who's been mugged by a homeless man or broken a leg falling through a floor because those people get out of it and stop doing stupid things. It's a whole community of people who have gotten lucky and have lost the sense of danger you probably should carry with you in those places. The drive up was uneventful and a bit quiet. Tony lived in a city about two hours away from me, so we really only met up to explore. After we talked through the basics that we never had time to before, like what we wanted to do with our lives, how many siblings we had, etc. We didn't have that easy camaraderie you have with someone that you knew well. The silence wasn't uncomfortable, but it wasn't casual either. We switched to showing each other music for the last few hours and we chatted about that. And I realized for really the first time that I didn't actually know Tony that well, even though we had planned a cross-state trip together. When we reached the city, we went to an industrial area first, passing the occasional abandoned house, though Tony and I had both agreed to avoid those. Standalone abandoned houses are arguably the most dangerous places you can explore. You see, with factories and warehouses, people don't really commit crimes on those because there is security and random people like us wandering around exploring. But abandoned houses are where people go to do drugs or where bodies are found. And in a tight space like that, it's hard to get out if someone else is there. We drove past a large factory with all the windows blown out and decided to wander in. There is a fence, but there were plenty of holes in it and no signs of cameras or active security. When we got in, it was pretty impressive, but I recognized some graffiti right away. There was a big mural of Bigfoot and an alien kissing on one of those more intact walls. I had seen at least two explorers I followed the post that same picture. I took a few pics too, of course. You have to take a picture of Bigfoot kissing an alien but I was a bit disappointed that we had stumbled into a well-known spot. The factory was nice and all, and it looked lovely with the dusting of snow the city had gotten, but it wasn't what I was looking for. When we got back to the car, I told Tony that we should try a different area, one with less of the industrial stuff. Do you want to pull up a map or something? He asked. We could look for old neighborhoods. Let's just get lost, I told him. And we did. We drove through downtown, which, by the way, if you've never been to Detroit, is actually very lovely. 
We got some food and then after a bit more wandering, we ended up in a more wooded area. Do you think we're getting out of the city? Tony asked. Looks like we're hitting the suburbs. Nah, not this close to downtown, I told him. We're probably just in an area with parks or something. Could be something neat over here. We drove a bit longer and pretty soon, one side of the street was all trees. There were a few run-down houses on the other side, but it looked almost like we were in a rural area with the massive forest taking up most of what we could see. Do you want to see if there's anything in the woods? Tony asked me. I did and I didn't. The woods were a different kind of creepy that I wasn't as familiar with, but that also made it exciting. Yeah, let's check it out. We parked just in front of the woods. No one was going to yell at us out here. And Tony took a screenshot of where his car was on the map. And with that, we stepped into the forest. It must have been an old park. The trees were tall and the undergrowth was thick. Even at the tail end of winter, it had been warm enough that many of the honeysuckles had never even dropped their leaves. For a city park, there was a distinct lack of trash, and I wondered if maybe we had found a nature preserve. But I didn't wonder about this for long. Soon we stumbled upon the first house. It had been white at one point with red trim, both of which were peeling now and largely overtaken by ivy, which had also kept its leaves despite the snow. We debated going in but decided against it, and just took some pictures of the exterior. And Tony had two lenses that he was switching between, but I didn't know all that fancy camera stuff. I just had a point and shoot with a great default setting, at least to my untrained eyes. We decided to keep going, and weren't walking for more than a minute when it became clear that the dense forest was hiding more secrets. The first building snuck up upon us, it was one of those red brick departments with all the balconies and nice trim around the outside of the windows. As we walked around the side of it, the forest revealed a whole row of similar structures behind the first, and starting a bit to the left, a second row. We had come at the first building from the side at exactly the right angle to hide the rest of the neighborhood. Looking farther to the left, it was clear that there was at least one more block behind this hiding of the forest. Tony and I shared a glance but didn't say anything. I was feeling a need to match the silence of the forest and I wondered if he was as well. We started photographing exteriors, staying close, and occasionally making eye contact as we kept tabs on each other. I had been feeling a bit awkward around Tony this trip, just hanging out in the car. But when we started shooting, I was reminded of how well we knew each other in the field. I would slow down when he was switching lenses, and he would nod to the best angles that I had missed, and we danced around each other and sang. This was what our friendship was based on, and it made me feel at ease. It made me feel too at ease. We were only about halfway down the first block, with the promise of much more in the way when I felt the urge to explore further. The exteriors were lovely, and though many of the buildings had the same design, each one had its own unique plant life. Vines or young trees sprouting up in tall grasses overtaking the lots. Some had fire damage, and a select few had graffiti. The sunlight through the trees hit every building differently, making them each unique. When we could have kept to the exteriors, there wasn't a need to go inside. I don't know why I said it. I wish I hadn't, but finally, I broke the silence. We should go in. You think it's safe? Tony asked. I mean, look at this place. People have got to come here all the time, right? I've never seen pictures of this before, Tony answered. And a lot of people I follow have been to Detroit. Heck, those two girls I went up to Cleveland with were from here and they had never mentioned this place. Well, if we're the first ones to find it, it would be a shame not to explore it more, right? What if it gets torn down in a year and we didn't look inside when we had the chance? I squinted to my right and saw at least another row of buildings off to the side. 
So, there is at least three blocks worth of stuff here. We could spend all day just exploring this place. Tony sighed. Okay, but if we get murdered, it's your fault. He said it jokingly. But those words will haunt me for the rest of my life. We pulled out our mag lights and picked out one of the buildings that didn't seem to have any fire damage. Most of the windows were broken, but when we walked in, we found that very little of the sunlight was making its way through. The inside was like every other abandoned interior, familiar but totally unique. The walls were mint green and peeling, and there was less destruction than one would normally find in an old house. The door frames and walls were largely intact, and the ceiling, with those big white school cafeteria panels, was only falling down in a few places. There was also a good deal of stuff left over from the last people who had lived there. It's always creepy the first time you find a house where it looks like the residents up and left in the middle of the night. But oftentimes, it's just because people left behind all the things they didn't want. Or in these sadder cases, they were rushed out during an eviction. We found toys strewn about in a child's room, always in eerie sight. And what used to be the master bedroom, there were clothes in the closets that didn't even look that old. It was a pretty intact house. We ventured upstairs and found more of these same men of the other units. Most of them still had people's stuff, and it didn't make me wonder what had happened. You usually don't find that in every building. If I had to guess, I would say like one in every five or six houses and apartments that I'd been in would still have a lot of the last owner's possessions. We were on the third floor taking pictures of a teddy bear that had been nailed to the wall when we had heard it. The noise came from the lower levels and sounded like a person moaning. We both froze in our tracks. It was a low moan that went on for a good 30 seconds or so, like some cheesy horror movie ghost. It didn't sound quite like it in the movies though. It sounded almost artificial like someone had recorded a scream and then slowed it down on the playback. Crap, Tony whispered. It sounds like there's, um, there's someone down there, I said. What do we do? Well, we can't stay here, he answered simply. I pulled out my mace and side by side, we began our descent. I was creeped out, of course, but I figured our options were either that there was someone messing with us or there was a homeless person doing something else. And while I desperately hoped for the first one, I felt that together we could fight off a half-naked homeless guy. But when we got downstairs, we didn't see anyone. There were no creaks or coughs or any other noises to indicate that a person had been there. When we got out of the building, we started to wonder if it had actually been a person making that noise. Maybe it was the wind, I said. Maybe or something settling in the house, Tony replied. And that's another thing about urban exploration that makes it so dangerous. You basically turn off any instincts that tell you that you're being the stupid person in a horror movie, and you learn to ignore creepy things. Half the buildings I've been in have graffiti that says, he's right behind you, or get out while you still can. Then you ignore things like stuffed animals nailed to the wall or old rusty handcuffs. Noises are the things that you take more seriously. But usually, it's the wind or something breaking, or the house settling. So you kind of train yourself to ignore all of those warning signs that you would normally listen to. We stepped into the next building and found even more of the things left behind by the old tenants. All of their furniture was still there and there were dishes left out on the table. That was more creepy but not unheard of. At the time, I thought it was more than likely that... Another explorer had set the table for a creepy photo shoot. You'd find a lot of stuff like that. Animal remains on spray-painted pentagrams. Fake blood poured out gratuitously over an abandoned hospital bed. People would do all kinds of things to make an edgy photo shoot even edgier. Of course, now I know that that hadn't been staged by anyone. I wish we had left then. We started taking pictures, but honestly, it's blurring together in my mind at this point. 
and the beds were messy but still had all the blankets, a rare sight, and I think we found another room full of toys. We made our way to the second floor, and that's when I saw the first one. I thought it was a bird. I had my light shining into an old bedroom, and Tony was in another one further back, so I knew that it wasn't him in the hallway. Out of the corner of my eye, coming down the dark and dank hallway was a light, ethereal shape. I quickly turned around and tried to shine my light on it, but the light went out. My eyes tried to adjust to the dark, but it was too soon. The shape glided through the air, distinctly not flapping, and I realized that it was most definitely not a bird. I thought perhaps it could be a moth or something, but... As it came closer to me down that long hallway, it became apparent that it was much too big. Though exactly how big it was, was a tough to pinpoint. It seemed to shift and ripple, and didn't look quite solid. Just then, Tony burst out of the room, dangerously close to the creature, and it spooked it. Tony shone his light in my face, but I could still make the form behind him. It turned to the right hand and vanished. There weren't any rooms on the right side of the hallway. It was like it had gone through the wall. And Tony registered me looking behind him and turned around, but he had missed it. He turned back to me and whispered, What is it? I don't know, I answered, walking towards the stairs. But we're getting the heck out of here. As we walked past the area the thing had vanished in, I saw a slit carved in the hallway. It was smooth and narrow like someone had taken a knife and carefully carved out just a bit of the wall. We took the stairs carefully, and I described what I had seen to Tony. It sounds like you saw a ghost, dude. And just as he had said that, we heard him moaning again, but quieter. I had to laugh. It was so absurd. But I quickly stopped, thinking that he might be right. I didn't think that I believed in ghosts, but I had no desire to see what that thing might actually have been. We made it outside and started heading out of the complex. For the first time, I looked at the ground, realizing that this must have at one point been a road. There was indeed some men hiding under the leafless winter undergrowth. I noticed cracks in the pavement, and some of them seemed very straight and smooth, which I thought was a bit odd. We were near the edge of the complex, almost back into the woods when we saw something drifting towards us through the trees. It looked like a bigger version of the thing I had seen in the house, and Tony's eyes widened. I didn't get a good look before we wordlessly moved to hide closer to one of the last buildings. As it grew closer, we stepped inside, hopefully out of its line of sight. The building we chose had a lot of fire damage, and the floor made me nervous, but not as nervous as the thing outside. We stepped further into the building carefully and ended up in the kitchen of one of the units. A glance back at the wall showed me more of those slash marks in varying sizes, as well as a calendar. Up until I saw it, I hadn't really been thinking about how old this place was, but I figured, based on the woods around it, it had to have been decades since it had been abandoned. But the calendar did not agree with that. It was open to December of 2009. I tapped Tony's shoulder and showed him, but he didn't pay it much attention. Too focused on the situation at hand. That was probably the smart move, but I was distracted now. It was all so strange. There were full-grown mature trees here that could not have been sprouted up in less than 20 years. The level of decay, I know can happen fast, but this place felt older than it should have. My thoughts were stopped when we heard moaning, this time at a lower pitch, coming from right outside of the building. It shifted in frequency and speed, sounding almost sexual, and we both stepped back into the house. We didn't look back or below us, and that was our mistake. In a second, we were both through the floor. I don't remember even hearing any cracking. I think that we might have just stepped off a ledge. 
and I landed on my back and felt all the air leave my lungs as I hit the floor. I didn't see how Tony landed, but I heard him scream. And when I regained my senses enough to look at him, I saw that his leg was twisted. I took in just these surroundings between us and saw numerous bones strewn about the basement. There were three deer skulls, but other than that, most of the bones were shattered. There were other antlers strewn about too. And though I felt my heart quickened at the sight of the graveyard, none of the remains appeared to be human. Ah, crap! Tony yelled and clutched at his leg. I didn't know what to do, but I started making moves to crawl over to him. But I stopped when I saw the white, spirit-looking thing glide down from above. And then my eyes locked onto a strange sight. Jammed into one of the holes in the wall was the unmistakable form of a human skull. It all happened fast after that. The thing flattened out making itself into a long, ribbony worm, and it approached Tony. It put its front close to his leg and wriggled its rounded edge. I couldn't make out any features, any sign of eyes or sensory organs or anything, but it was interested in his injury. It straightened out once again, and then in a flash, it folded around Tony. The thing put its back end in one of the crevices in the ground and began pulling, Tony followed as it retreated into the hole, sliding along as if this wispy thing had grabbed onto something even more intangible. Tony clawed at the ground and looked at me, pleading for help but unable to conjure up the words and I just sat there. When it had reached the hole though, I had hoped it would drop him because it looked too narrow to bring prey so large into that burrow. But the creature didn't even slow down as it dragged Tony's leg into the crevice. It lost no momentum when it reached Tony's torso, and I heard his ribs crack. He let out the last scream that he ever would, as I watched the bits that wouldn't fit slough off at the edge of the ground. When the creature had him up to his neck, Tony's head simply popped off with a crack. I stared at Tony's severed head and at the hole for a minute in shock. The edge of the hole was red with the bones and flesh that wouldn't bend to fit in the hole. Tony's head was facing away from me. That was a small mercy for me at least. I got out of the woods but I don't really remember it. I think that I was in shock. I didn't see any more creatures though. They already had what they needed. I lost my phone at some point, probably when I fell. And I had to fly down a car to take me to the police station. I told them what happened, but I don't think that they believed me. They found Tony's car though, but his body has never been recovered. I wondered if maybe the police decided not to check, because they clearly thought that I was on drugs. Or perhaps they know not to go there. Maybe the people who live near that patch of woods stay out of it. It sounds paranoid, but I don't know how else they wouldn't have found his head so freshly severed in that basement. I tried to talk to Tony's girlfriend about what happened, but I don't think she believed me either. But I know that she had his last known location on her phone, and she said that if the cops couldn't find his body, she'll do it herself. She had been gone for a week now, and that's why I decided to write all of this down. I couldn't save her, but maybe if I can warn as many people as I can, I can save someone else. So please, listen to me. Don't go urban exploring in Detroit. But if you do, stay in the city. Stay the heck away from the woods. Headlights on. Headlights off. Written by TJ Lee. They say this trail covers ancient land, that the things you find along here aren't for the normal-minded to see. Honestly, I just took a detour after a rough night and decided that this was a good excuse to lengthen out my drive and listen to some good music. But now I'm dictating my thoughts to my notepad like a neurotic a-hole because a stream of consciousness spoken to nobody seems too weird to me. 
I'd rather be Dale Cooper than Jack Torrance. The in-car system still lets dulcet tones from my lo-fi playlist hang in the air. The wonders of modern technology, I suppose. Not so loud that it drowns out my thoughts or interrupts the beauty of the drive, but enough to allow me to be introspective and feel like I'm going on my own trip of self-discovery. Right, the trip, of course. The first thing you see as you come off the last turning on the finely paved concrete is a series of signs that lead off into the dirt road that stretches into the darkness and dips out of sight. The first was the normal highway sign, standing at the back with a slight crook to the side, the paint flaking away at the edges, but the sign shimmering in front of my car's lights. A705 North, A705 South, M Road, 300 yards west. There was a crude sign hanging in front, practically peering down at me from a clearly damaged pole in the dirt. The letters scratched and blotchy. Stretching out in front of you is a featured oddity within UB Dedra's dusk light circus. The trans fixing allure of the myopic road beckons all. Simply start your journey and let the delights find you. A small post it note had been attached to the bottom, hastily scribbled. Remember, do not turn on your headlights. Do not expose the trail ahead. Drive slow and drive safe. It's the dead of night. This part of the country doesn't have many folks out to these back roads at the best of times, and quarantine simply exacerbated that. I took a deep breath and looked at my knuckles as they gripped the steering wheel, skin tearing away and raw flesh exposed, stinging in the wake of the biting cold. I thought of what I had driven away from, what I'm always trying to get away from. I closed my eyes and see the looming red shaves, the haze of anger and the hot flush of pain. I gripped the steering wheel tighter and clenched my teeth as I put my foot down and turned the wheel towards the road. The myopic road is simply an unofficial title, of course. No planning committee would sign off on such a strange name. Not even a very subtle one for that matter. Short-sighted because of the sheer darkness enveloping the trail from side to side, inevitably causing accidents, our ancestors have a very ugly sense of humor. But it was fitting. The road was something of an anomaly in my hometown and while nobody had been actively dissuaded from going down it, nobody ever needed to reinforce the fear we all felt. Now, the accidents were a frequent enough reminder if you drove down the road with respect and patience, they say it's just a good place to cleanse the mind and help you focus. Plenty have come out on the other side without any problems, or so they say. But there were many, far too many, who didn't obey the rules, didn't heed them or even see them. Be it someone intoxicated behind the wheel, those escaping the law, joyriders or just general thrill-seekers, they would all inexplicably find themselves coming down the myopic road, and they would almost always find themselves meeting with an ugly end. Sometimes, patrol cars would find the wreckage after a couple of days, scraps of their clothing or maybe even an identifiable piece of a person. Other times, a single liver could find itself draped over the sign leading into the trail, ten years after its owner went missing. But oftentimes, most people didn't get found at all. No vehicle and no trace. When police officers would pursue offenders towards this trail, they would simply stop at the threshold and flash their headlights, desperately trying to convince them to come back. That and any fate is better than what lay down that road. Or maybe they were hoping, wishing in vain that the driver had seen the one rule when traversing down the myopic road. Do not turn on your headlights. So here I am. I had been driving for about 10 minutes now at a relatively slow pace. The moonlight above has helped me see just a bit ahead, and I could feel my mind wandering. I remember one of the last things I said out loud to a living and breathing person. 
How dare you? I'm not standing for this anymore, you hear me? I hope you choke. I remember the hot bile in my throat and my shaking fist as I spat venom in their face, their eyes wide and full of fear and rage. I remember my fist connecting with their jaw over and over before I finally... What the heck? I had to stop. There's something in the road. The clearing is narrowing. These huge trees permeate every aspect of my windscreen, and they tower over me. They're old and some are gnarled. The bark is blackened and small insects crawl over them. I think that I see birds perched on a pair of branches just above me, but I can't recall ever seeing birds with necks that long or eyes that white. The moon's light is beginning to wane and the further I traverse, the harder it is to make things out. But it didn't stop me from seeing a thing some 20 feet ahead of me, hunched over as if vomiting, shoulders rotating and shuddering as the hind legs red up. My hand instinctively goes for the little dial that turns on my headlights and I stop myself. Do not turn on the headlights. Crap. I take a look back and try to figure out if I can reverse on the trail, do a three-point turn and go back. But by now it's obvious that the embankment on either side is high, and the trees are too close to allow for any space. Crap. Nothing else for it, I tell myself. I push down on the pedal and I move forward slowly, revving the engine in hopes that this deer-like creature gets the hint in its scampers. It doesn't. I see its hind legs rise off the ground and twist towards me, a single bulbous eye fixing on me. I honk the horn on instinct and this thing immediately drops down to all fours and runs off for the woods. I've been driving again now for a few minutes. The road is getting dark, but I'm doing as instructed and letting my mind wander. Every kick, shove, punch, and barbed jab brings me a new wave of renewed anger and disgust. That filthy pig thinking they could ever make things right, that it was just a one-off, promising never again. Pathetic. I can still feel my clenched fists gleefully smashing into their face over and over the crunching of their nose and the tears in their eyes as they begged and pleaded for mercy. Ah, mercy. Should never be given to scum like that. A smile curls around my lips as I feel my thighs sear with hot pain. My neck tightening and my entire frame reliving the muscle memory of fights that long past. The road was beginning to dip and I could sense a bend was coming up. Not something that I had expected. It's only when I take a look in my rearview mirror on instinct that I see it. Bloodshot eyes. Black fur eclipsing all of its features save for the tusks protruding from its top lips. Vicious, black liquid dripping off of them. This thing was matching my smile and I watched its pupils dilate as if they were getting ready to pounce. I floored without thinking and I made the most critical mistake. Headlights on. It was just for a moment. Just to get me away safely from this thing and see where the heck I was going. But it showed me what was lurking on the side of the trees. Clinging to the branches. Clawing at the depths of my peripheral vision. I saw flesh move in ways that it shouldn't. Human bodies devoid of features save for long, dark streaks of red. I saw too much. I saw something I didn't wish to see, their body broken and battered beyond repair, laying in the road, mangled as if they had been ran over by. They looked up at me just for a moment, no, headlights off. I checked the locks on the door and I burst into tears, shameful, angry tears. My knuckles hurt more than ever, and razors line my throat as I hold back a scream. I remember grabbing my things and leaving. They were choking on the floor and begging me to stay. I remember the fear in their words as they struggled to move broken fingers and speak between mouthfuls of blood and broken teeth. I remember the hatred that I felt for them when I took one last look at them and had all the power in the world 
telling them the one thing I knew would haunt them forever. I will go to the one place you cannot follow. You will never have me. I heard them stumble to get up as I went for the door. A slip, a grunt, a bump, a crack, and a slump to the floor. But I did not look back. Not once. I don't like to think of what happened to them. Not out of fear for the repercussions, but for the fear of returning to my old self that sympathized with them, that coddled to them, that depended on them. Something moved in the trees by my window. It was gangly, small, and it flung itself from the base of the tree, with arms too wide for its frame, like a comic book character enshrouded in darkness. The birds overhead are still on that same branch. They've grown in number and their necks are twisting as they look down at me. I know they're eyeing me up now, the drool from their beaks coating my windscreen and hissing as it makes contact. Maybe I deserve to be here. Maybe this is my punishment for letting my temper get the better of me and inflicting pain on someone that I was supposed to love. That age-old adage of, they deserved it, seemed hollow in my throat even now when I dictate it. Words crumbling to dust as they pass my teeth, an echo when succeeding my lips, hanging in the still air of my car, as a mocking reminder of my pure weakness. I'll show them weakness. I wipe my tears away and look ahead to the now barely lit road. It continues to descend and I see no signs of it leveling out, but I put my foot down and accelerate regardless. Headlights on. The quicker I go, the more it becomes to reach out from the sides of the car. Sometimes, I think I recognize them in that fleeting moment. An old friend I once said something cruel to in jest. A university roommate whose food I ate when they had little to no money. An ex that I cheated on. My lover. All of them momentarily highlighted by nothing more than natural lighting and waning instinct. Their faces contorted into hideous expressions of rage. Malnourished bodies reaching out with frail limbs as they try to get a hold of my car. I almost don't see them in the road. I slam on my brakes and stare at them. Their towering figure all the more imposing in the isolation of this road. Not a single scrap of skin left on their body, only pure red flesh. Their face full of bruises. A black eye and tears of blood running down their face at what remains of their jaw inonates these same words. Never again. They take long, powerful steps towards the hood of my car. Never again, alone. They place two broken, mangled hands on the side of the hood and leap forward. Their broken face frozen between despair and rage as they rear their head back and careen their skull into the windscreen. Over and over, as their pain shrieks get louder, the glass threatening to shatter as it distorts under the pressure. Everything floods back, and in that moment, I am once again my old self and full of an incalculable fear. But it is only when they speak aloud that a full sentence do I snap out of it. Never again will you be alone. Headlights off. I will not be that person again. I accelerate fast, brake hard and watch as they go flying, their body greeting the pavement with a vile crunch as they twist and crunch, coming to a stop some 15 feet ahead of me twitching. I feel my knuckles burn as they grip the steering wheel, and I resist the urge to get out and finish the job with my bare hands. Broken promises from a broken person, I spit. You will never be anything more. I push hard in the accelerator as the car thunders over them, offering no resistance as they slip onto the tires and two short, sickening bumps follow as I continue on. It didn't take long for the bravado to slip, however. Ten minutes down the road, I slow to a crawl and roll the window down to vomit between sobs. The air is thick with iron, and I can hear a croaking emanating from the embankment opposite my window. It fills my head with nauseating thoughts and my eyes start to glaze over. But the jerking sensation of my engine stalling is enough to pull me back inside. The road is leveling out now. 
the moon overhead casting a powerful yellow glow over the pathway, now not dissimilar to that of a supermoon, maybe even bigger. I can see the jagged cracks on its surface, thick blots and was the moon always so split? I feel like it's pulsating when I stare at it, or is it simply getting closer? That is not the moon. There's a small black dot in the center of it, following me as I start down the road. A low drone groaning in volume as I pick up speed down this stretch of road, desperate for an exit. How can this go on for so long? Surely there's an end in sight. I feel my thoughts start to spill out and dissipate before I can fully comprehend them. Like my mind is a sponge being squeezed of all moisture. When I look up at the orb, I see thick red veins around the sides splitting open. It's an eye. Their eye. Never letting me out of their sight for a moment as was always the way. That drone, their incessant call to action, a threat of what would occur if I didn't respond in a timely fashion. Think what you will of me, but I did what I had to do and I'm not sorry for it. They can follow me to the ends of the earth, but I will not apologize for taking a stand. When you love someone, you're supposed to protect them, to make them a part of your own heart and entrust yours in kind. It is safety, trust, vulnerability, and so much more. It is never meant to be a microcosm of fear, subjugation, and pain. I know what the road is doing, what it is showing me. My sins, my failures, my fears. They all go back to them, as they always have done. That last night, they had followed me incessantly from room to room, not allowing me a moment's respite, and like a shadow, they clung to me seeping into my skin and making it burn from the inside out. I could not breathe from the suffocation both metaphorically and inevitably, literally when I would request space. I don't know what triggered me to finally stand up for myself. Perhaps it was the way they had been acting in our latest quarantine, staring at me like a predator sizing up a meal. Maybe it was the constant humming over me while I slept, as if grappling with their own instincts to kill. But either way, I felt their thin fingers wrap around my neck, and their barbed words as they spat expletive after expletive. You pathetic pig. Nobody will ever want you the way I do. You belong to me and I will do with you as I see fit. You're less than the roadkill that birds feed on. They would grin and watch as the life faded from my eyes, just enough so that they could let go and know that I was on the verge of passing out. I heaved as they let me go, still clawing at my throat in a desperate attempt to rid their presence of me and my soft sobs filling the room. They didn't like that. Oh my god, I don't care, can you shut up? A powerful kick met my stomach as I lay prone on the ground, their hands over their heads and genuine anger on their face, as if I had just spat on them. You don't ever think about the consequences of your actions, do you? Do you ever consider that you wouldn't be here? We wouldn't be here if you just didn't mess up all the time. I remember they kneeled down and their bright blue eyes shimmered as they gently cut my face and flashed that smile that immediately put me under their spell. But I may as well have been face to face with a crocodile. You know I could kill you and nobody would even care about a freak like you, right? Nobody will ever love you. Never again. You will always be alone. My right hand connected with her jaw and the force was strong enough to dislocate it in one fell swoop. They collapsed back and looked at me in bewilderment, their eyes full of fear. And if anyone walked in on us at that moment, you would think that I was their lifelong tormentor. They had no understanding of why they deserved to be punished, why they deserved pain and torment. They truly believed in their hearts that they were above such things and that made me angrier. I can see the thing above growing red. The road is becoming dim and I can sense that wide-eyed beast is gaining in the car, but I will not relent. I will not stop. With every successive strike, I felt them wither under my weight. They kept bleeding out that same pathetic line. Never again, 
will always be alone. When they stumbled and fell, I was sure they were close to death from the sound alone, yet I refused to go back and help. I wanted them to know what true loneliness in those final moments, callous as it may be. I must sound like such a horrible person to you, in spite of everything that I endured. But my hands are shaking as I grip the steering wheel. The road is darkened and as I go slower, I can feel this thing gaining on me, determined to do God knows what once it catches up to me. The road is beginning to climb now. In the dim light left, I can see a steep curve going up. I would need to push on the accelerator and... Oh, there are pits across the road. Numerous potholes that could easily stall the car if I'm not careful. I cannot do it in the darkness. Perhaps myopic road is not unlike the journey of self-discovery. We start our maddening descent. We face our troubles at the middling road. And we continue our road to healing and betterment with the uphill struggle. Or maybe I'm simply terrified beyond belief and wishing to make sense of a place that is devoid of almost none. I can't go back now. The police will have discovered the body and no matter what defense I offer, I will be trading one prison for another. No, this road is all that I have left now. I think I'll put on some music for the last leg of the journey. The red eye above is pulsating, but I think it is not dissimilar to my lover. If you fight against it and show defiance, it'll hold and no sway over you, even if fear grips every fiber of my being. Perhaps I won't find anything, and I'll simply go until my car runs out of gas, letting the beasts of this wood take me. Maybe I'll get to the other side and be a free person for the first time in my adult life. Maybe the shape, some ways up the road, towering over the trees with long antlers jutting out of its skull will be helpful, not a hindrance. Either way, I must drive. Whatever happens, happens. Put yourself before anyone else. Do not let their anger and fear become a catalyst for pain and suffering. You will always have the power to take agency back and break free, hopefully in a less violent way than I did. The myopic road will be waiting for you when you wish to make your own journey. Perhaps I will be too. Headlights on. I would like to extend a large thank you to today's sponsor, Green Chef. In case you haven't heard, Green Chef is a CCOF a certified meal kit company that makes eating well easier than it's ever been. On top of that, it's the most sustainable meal kit out there. And Green Chef is committed to our planet, making sure that they offset 100% of their plastic packaging in every box and 100% of their carbon footprint and emissions. I know that I really appreciate that, and alongside being environmentally friendly, they're also downright delicious. Every meal that I've received from Green Chef has not only made me feel like I'm eating healthier, but it's also tasted amazing. Green Chef offers 35 nutritious and flavorful options to choose from every week, featuring premium clean ingredients that are seasonally sourced for peak freshness. I can't recommend them enough. Go to greenchef.com slash mrcreeps130 and use code mrcreeps130 to get $130 off plus free shipping. Again, that's greenchef.com slash mrcreeps130 and use code mrcreeps130 to get $130 off plus free shipping. Thank you again to Green Chef, the number one meal kit for eating well. I found a town in the middle of the desert. The inhabitants weren't human. Written by South Park is Cool. I was supposed to be traveling throughout the desert with a small team of five people. But in the middle of the trip, we all got separated by a brutal sandstorm. I tried to radio my teammates. They answered, trying their best to find out where I was. I kept walking north, the direction that we came from. 
I kept hearing the cries from my other team members over the radio. They were trying their best to find each other as well, but they weren't successful. The storm went on for about half an hour, obscuring everything around me, forcing me to keep my eyes closed most of the time. Twenty minutes into the storm, my radio went completely silent. It made a weird interference noise. One that I hadn't heard come from the radio before. The radio was still working, but I couldn't reach anybody. No one answered at all. Another ten minutes later, the storm was clearing up. I looked around for any sign of, well, anything, but only sand dunes were around me. I kept walking north. I dreaded the idea that I was going to be too hard to find. About twenty sand dunes later, I noticed something small off in the distance. A black line with what looked like structures behind it. I needed to get to some sort of civilization soon. I was starting to really get hungry. And also, who knows, the rest of the team was probably already there too. I picked up my pace, walking towards the structures. As I got closer to it, I realized it was a walled settlement. The buildings popping up over the wall looked like an average of four to seven story commercial buildings, just like anything you would see in a normal downtown area. I saw an opening a little bit to my left. When I reached it, it looked a little bit more advanced than it had looked from further away. Before I walked into the town, I heard a sound I could barely describe. It was similar to a tuba in a way. I looked behind me to look for its source. A truck shaped like a pentagon was driving towards the town. I stepped back away from the gate. When the truck arrived, it stopped. The passenger of the truck, well, he didn't look human. He looked like a humanoid giraffe with a huge jaw. It looked towards me. It saw me staring at it. It let out a low growl. I noticed the driver looked exactly like him. He turned to me as well. And he let out the same low growl. What is happening? I thought. The two things looked back on the road. They drove into the settlement. It was weird, but I really needed some food. So I walked through the opening into town. I ran past the gate as it began to close. I looked forward out into the town. It looked like a regular downtown area, but just in the middle of the desert. It was confusing, honestly. There was no town like this on any map of this desert that I had looked at before. I walked down the sidewalk, looking around for any sign of my other team members. The part of the town that I was in was mostly empty though I did see a car passing by in the distance. As I walked down the street, there was something slightly off about the air. It was kind of different in a way. It didn't solve my hunger, though. After some more walking, I came across a normal convenience store. I walked inside. It seemed like your average convenience store but the cashier didn't look human. He had the same figure as a human, but he was a dark green. He had eyes almost as big as his head. He saw me and made eye contact with me, 
So I glanced away and looked at the food. It was all wrapped in wrappers with weird symbols and random letters on them. The images of the food were bad, but I had not recognized any of it. Since it was convenience store food, I just decided to trust it anyway. When I put the food on the counter, the cashier spoke with a metallic purr. It gave me chills, in fact. It was so uncanny. I gave him $10 for the food, and he made that same purr sound again. Also, he never seemed to blink. It was like he was staring at me. He didn't do anything with the cash. So I decided to just take it back. I put it back in my wallet and then I left the store. I continued to make my way up the street. I had no idea what this place was. It didn't seem like any sort of dress-up convention. These beans looked too realistic. I had never seen it before. I came across three beans standing on a street corner. I was hoping that they had spoke English. Hi, can any of you tell me where I am? They stared at me. They didn't have eyelids either, so they could have just been confused, I thought. They each made loud noises that sounded like an emergency alert sound. They were chilling. Their eyes dilated until their entire eyes were dark purple voids. I backed away, but then they rushed towards me, pushing me to the ground. And then they pointed at me while making those demonic growling noises. I got up and sprinted away from them. My heart was racing. I began to think that I was about to be taken by these things. I had no idea what they were, but they seemed more demonic the more that I looked at them. I could hear multiple footsteps. I risked a glance behind me, and those beings were chasing after me. I picked up my pace, running towards the wall at the town limit. A siren started blaring overhead. It was somewhere behind me. I looked back. A car with flashing yellow lights was getting close behind me. It slowed down as it reached where I was. The passenger windshield rolled down. Two creatures were in the car, and the passenger side creature pointed some sort of makeshift weapon at me. I ran a little faster, but then my body felt like it had locked up. I fell to the ground. I couldn't move a muscle. The dread was building up inside of me. A few seconds later, I was pulled up off the ground by the two creatures. They had eyes that stretched all the way around their heads, with the same dark green skin too. They held me up against the wall. One of them pulled a shorter creature in front of him. The shorter creature also had a green skin, but four claws too. The officer creature from the car shot the shorter creature, and then he waved the weapon at me, nodding his head. I could only think that he was signaling that I was about to meet the same fate as the smaller creature. Chills ran all over me. The dread got deeper, as I had nowhere to go without potentially meeting something fatal. The officer creature holding me against the wall took out a piece of paper. It had a picture of a human on it. He was in a jail cell. Random letters were written above the image. The only thing that it could make out was a name. Jack Carlton. The officer growled at me. He pointed towards the cell in the image. The guy must have also stumbled upon this place, 
But then he got arrested. Did all of this trouble have to do with the mere presence of a human? I wondered. Humans must be threatening to them. But how? I didn't want to spend my time in a jail in whatever place this was, just because I randomly stumbled by. Unfortunately, these beings didn't speak any human language that I knew of. The officer clawed at the left side of my head. It hurt badly. I didn't know what they wanted, but I needed to get away from them. The three creatures who pointed at me earlier ran up towards me. Two were carrying batons, and one was holding a map of the world. I didn't get a good look at the map, but it looked like balkanization had run wild. The dread I felt inside only got worse. The officer creatures walked in front of me. They both charged at the three creatures, pushing, whacking, and even punching them down to the ground. The creatures were about to attack me, but the officers had stopped them. The officers must have thought the three were about to attack them. While the officers were attacking the three creatures on the ground, the creatures and the creature cops all growled wildly during their altercation with each other. They began to get into a fist fight too, and amidst that, I decided it was my time to escape. I ran away quickly, filled with adrenaline. I ran past the fence at the town limits, and I made my way back out into the desert. I ran down the sidewalk, breathing heavily, wondering if I would get away alive. As I ran, multiple gunshots rang out behind me. I heard the thud of one bullet hitting the ground right beside me. I ran off the road, deep into the sandy desert. My heart felt like it was beating faster than I could run. I ran for about ten minutes, only thinking about getting away from the town. To my surprise, I heard someone speak to me through my radio. Hello, Dapperton. We're still looking for you. If you can hear this, please say copy. I jumped. I took out my radio, and I answered the guy on the other end. Copy, this is Dapperton. I don't know where I am. There was this weird town that I was almost arrested in. Uh, they almost got me, I said. Your location is up on our radar now. Later, my boss picked me up from where he found me. I told him all about the town. And he told me that there was no town in the direction that I came from. He even showed me a map of the area. No names popped up. I showed him the scar on the side of my head, and he was weirded out by it, mostly because there was nothing in the desert that could have given me such a scar, while according to him, he didn't believe my story about the creatures or the town. Instead, he looked concerned about whatever idea he had of what may have happened to me while I was off the radar. When I got back home, I looked at the area on Google Maps. I couldn't find any sign of a town anywhere within that area. I looked all over that desert just to make sure the town wasn't there. I looked up Jack Carlton to see if anything would pop up in the local news. There was a Jack Carlton who went missing in 2010, though it stated his body was recovered. He had passed of dehydration. However, when I looked at his image, it matched the one the officer creature had showed me. And did I go through a dimensional slip? No trace of the town can be found anywhere. Is the town a government cover-up or something? If the missing Jack Carlton is the same one who had been arrested by those creatures, then did the government cover it up? I don't know, I'm so confused. 
I imagined a scenario where I retraced my steps through that desert to see if I would find the town again. However, I'm not going to do that. I don't want to go back to that town again. In fact, I'm going to stay away from going too far into that desert. I was on an expedition to a newly discovered World War II base in the Antarctic. Written by 10 Minutes Horror. I was half an hour into my third flight today. At least this one was almost over. It had started 14 hours ago, flying from DC to Cape Town. There I caught a flight to Novo Air Base in the Antarctic. And we were now flying west along the Mulig Hoffman Mountains to a small camp set up by the US military. There was a recent discovery, and as a frequent business associate, I was called in to consult. I was briefed quickly, a flood of information compacted down. A World War II base had been discovered, hidden in a deep valley under a mountain. It had the name Festung 212 carved into the rock above the entrance. Festung was German for fortress, no question who it belonged to. There was said to be a massive weapons cache, and they wanted high-level opinions on them, so I would appraise them and categorize, perhaps even reverse-engineer certain tech, if it somehow surpassed ours, or it was a theoretical consult. They would want theories of types of weapons that the Germans could have below, if they hadn't already investigated. I'm guessing the types of weaponry the Germans would have is kind of like guessing what type of ammo a shooter's gonna use. It's limited but varied. We basically know the limits of their tech, because we had faced it in battle. But that was the thing with the Nazis. They experimented. I had studied Nazi warfare and the different categories of weaponry they used. I had also studied how they had been attempting to harness black magic to blend with modern technology. They weren't anchored down by morals or ethics, right or wrong, good or evil. In their eyes, they were the good and they were destroying the evil. I had read that Hitler sent out massive exploration parties to various parts of the globe, searching for mythical artifacts, lost civilizations, advanced but abandoned. Anything that could give the Krauts answers or an edge in warfare. We were lucky they hadn't discovered anything, as far as we knew. Now I'm what you call a weapons engineer. I won't go into my education, but it's extensive and involves engineering and biotech. I was poached young, groomed and built to create a psych ops and mass casualty military tech. I started a private firm called String Control. We didn't advertise online. We designed ways to destabilize nations for private corps and equity firms. We used a variety of methods, from social to technological, to pharmaceutical to political, to two million other tactics that we had up our sleeves. My previous contract was with a Southeast Asian country trying to invade and take over another country without using any physical force. We looked into the target country and found that three quarters of its economy was based on agriculture, so we simply needed to control the weather. Now, this might seem like a conspiracy theory idea, but it's real science. The Saudi Arabians have been adapting it for years. It's referred to as a cloud seeding, and uses drones to force precipitation with electrical charges. There are other ways of doing this, like adding substances through chemtrails, such as silver iodide, to existing clouds to induce rain, or even snow. But with flooding, the news of the disaster would enter the national stage and other countries would send help. We had to avoid that. So, we designed a system of drones to perform the opposite. For two months, the target country didn't receive a drop of rain. Their economy crumbled as no one could grow or sell or eat. And the target government caved and agreed to all terms. 
After the target had signed on the dotted lines, our employer paid us to flash flood the country for two days anyways, just out of spite. It was disgusting, certainly, but I figured I'd be getting hired by another country to take this one out soon enough, and I looked forward to that day. I also had a lexicon of contacts for old World War II weapons and paraphernalia, buyers and collectors, and not the ones you would find in the yellow pages. But this felt bigger than that. This felt secretive on a dangerous level. I thought back to the Germans. I wondered what type of weapons they were working on, how advanced they were for their time. It wasn't just the artillery that I was interested in seeing. I was hoping to take a look at some of their labs. I was fascinated with their experiments. What was he working on next, though? Genes, gases, viruses. What a horrible man he was. They all were. I sat back exhausted. It wasn't just the flights or the time changes. I was burned out with work and had been planning to walk away for some time. My conscience was starting to catch up to me. Something I thought I had shrunken down to the subatomic level and buried in lead. I thought about some of the horrible things that I had been hard to do in the past. My mind was regurgitating it all more lately, like I was in confession with myself. One of my first contracts was with a pharmaceutical company, lacing dormant but aggressive strains of meningitis and vitamin shots. We were given carte blanche by the observing medical bodies because they had a meningitis treatment regiment nearing release, so we played a little bit of God. We tested other illnesses and diseases and made some frightening discoveries. If you give a certain percentage of the population a debilitating illness, it becomes genetic. If they have kids, they'll get it and pass it on too. There's a reason you see it all a lot more today than in the past. It's not just because the population's grown. And then I moved on to pediatrics, but I won't go into that. That's what causes me the most nightmares. The snow and cold hit me in the face the second the airplane door opened and I stepped out. Even with a thick multi-clava and scarp, this was a different kind of chill. My shoulders shot up, touching my ears. We were directed to a series of snowmobiles that took us to another, even smaller camp. There, we were given snowshoes and had to hike to the rocky summit of the Mulanghafen Mountain, a few hundred meters away. I could see a muted orange glow coming from what appeared to be a large doorway at the end of the footpath that we were following. It wasn't a door, but it was an entrance carved into the rock. It led into a tunnel lined with mining lights. We followed our guides as the path curved and winded and took us deeper under the mountain. Our guides began taking off their gloves, hats, and jackets. What were they doing? Wouldn't it be getting colder the deeper that we went? I passed several explosive charges attached to support beams throughout the tunnel. The explosives looked old and had German writing on them. Our guides informed us that they were connected to other explosive charges set up at strategic points throughout the mountain to collapse in on itself if needed. Why would that be needed, I thought. Our path curved ahead, and I felt warmth in my face. We turned a corner and found ourselves in a massive open cave. What was I looking at? The cave was lit by pot lights pointed up. They sent frightening, jagged shadows up the walls to the stalactites hanging down. But I saw green. So much green. This far north, all you see is white and gray. But this resembled something closer to a botanical garden. There were luscious vegetation in a pond. The long stalactites hanging from the roof of the cave were covered in foliage. Our guide saw my shocked face and told me that we were in a geothermal pocket. The mountain was lined with them and they were rich in vitamins and minerals. So they sustained multiple types of hot springs and plant life, even without photosynthesis. But the greenery wasn't what held my attention any longer. At the far end of the overwhelming cave, a gargantuan ancient statue of a bearded, Herculean-like hero keeping evil at bay 
was carved into the rock. The statue's hand was pressing what appeared to be a large creature's head into the ground. It was like a hawk butt with teeth. Or a dragon. The longer I stared at the statue, the more the word God seemed the only fitting way to describe it. In front of the statue, a small portable had been set up, and that's where we were headed. Our guide told me to follow him and his staff specifically as we moved through the flora. I stopped and touched one of the plants but hadn't seen anything like it before. It had multiple veins of varying colors running through it. There were a half dozen scientists and military personnel sprinkled throughout the cave, some with metal detectors. Oh crap, they were looking for landmines. I followed our guide's footsteps perfectly. We entered the portable. Inside there was a large freight elevator, a mix of old German technology and our updated modern type. Lieutenant Colonel Sullivan stood by it, ready to debrief me. But first, he recommended that we stick to the approved path and hallways. The Germans had left booby traps. In the first two days of discovery, five scientists and three soldiers had died from a variety of old tripwires and nail bombs. It had been messy, but they believed it was safe now. Great. Stick to the past and hallways. Got it. Sullivan moved on. The elevator was in fact built by the Germans, but the military believed the hole it went into had been discovered by them, not formed. The hole dropped 13 kilometers straight down into the earth. At the depth of 4 kilometers, there was an elevator switchover, which dropped another 5 and there, an additional elevator switchover was needed for the final four kilometers to reach the hole's depth of 13 clicks. The elevator was the only way up or down. Though there was a second tunnel up that ran parallel to the first switch, but it looked to be dug by the Germans as a backup route. It appeared they hadn't moved on to dig any for the next two levels, at least from what had been found. This pathway was located just to the side of the elevator platform at the first to switch over and was said to take between four and five hours to climb to the surface in a very cramped and slanted crawl space. We were given heat repellent suits and instructed to stay inside the compounds at all times upon reaching the bottom level, which was where we were headed. How the heck was there a naturally formed hole that went this deep? Maybe the Germans really had discovered something. As we rode down, my first thought was this was being used as a massive missile silo. 13 kilometers down though, what kind of tech did they really have? Or worse, find. What if they discovered a new type of energy source? Something that dwarfed enriched uranium and fission capability and output. I got chills. It reminded me of the most dangerous weapon that I had ever heard of that was, thankfully, never used. The weapon was part of Project Pluto, a nuclear R&D division of the U.S. military, and was referred to as SLAM, as in supersonic low-altitude missile. It was massive, and in order to reach ramjet speed, it would need to be launched by conventional rocket boosters from the ground. After reaching cruising altitude in unpopulated areas near the target, a nuclear core would be made critical. It would then have unlimited range from its energy source and cruise in circles until it was ordered down to the deck. That meant the SLAM, which would be carrying a mass payload of nuclear weapons, would turn the cruise missile into an unmanned bomber and deliver all of its warheads to the targets in an unwavering storm. But it didn't end there. After the payload was delivered, the missile could then spend weeks flying over nearby populated areas at low altitudes and cause massive shockwaves and deadly radiation that would destroy entire cities. If and when the missile went down, it would spew deadly radiation for hundreds of years to these surrounding areas. Someone had actually thought of using this. There was no way the Germans had gotten that far, though. We changed onto the next elevator, which was located on a platform directly below us. The hole was said to be perfectly straight, going down through earth, ice, rock, and granite. 
As we rode the second elevator down, I watched the walls passing and noticed that they weren't digging or claw marks or anything. This really was unnaturally formed. When we changed over to the third and final elevator, I started to think about what the hole had been used for. Sacrifice. It might be naturally formed somehow, but the statue in front of it was carved by man. It reflected us after all. Now I wondered if there were more statues where we were headed. There couldn't be. It'd be too hot without suits. Unless they, whoever they were, had found a way. We arrived at the bottom of the hole, which opened up to a large cavern with multiple German-built facilities inside. There was a large weapons cache and depot, a series of laboratories and multiple bunking dormitories spread through large open caverns in the earth. Apparently, there were stockpiles of canned food and supplies to last decades down there. I couldn't believe that I was actually here. I wasn't aware of anyone who had descended this far. Even now, 80 years later, I had only heard of the coldest super deep in Russia in the 80s, reaching 12 clicks before it was shut down. Mysterious circumstances and subterranean sounds was the byline for the closure, if I recall correctly. It hadn't been drilled or dug through rock and granite and earth, though. The cola had been strategically placed to take advantage of permafrost below the surface. Ice was far easier to drill through than rock and granite, and it had taken them years to dig. And this was deeper. We appeared to be in another geothermal pocket, but the plants were all purples and reds and oranges here. The steam rose from fissures on the ground like hydrothermal vents at the bottom of the ocean. I stared out the tiny windows of the compound, unbelieving the life that could survive down here at this depth with this heat. I was directed to the bunk rooms where I would be sleeping when and if I needed it. Sullivan then brought me to the weapons cache where it had already been swept for booby traps. That made the crater in the pit of my stomach a little bit smaller. I was still thinking about the eight men who had died in the first two days. Naturally, I had been wondering if the Nazis had used some kind of trigger and gear traps. I would love to take a look at their handiwork, but we would start with the nuclear arsenal. Apparently, the Uran Project, which was the name for Germans' nuclear tech research, had not in fact harnessed nuclear. They had stockpiled hundreds of bombs, though, the largest being the SC 2500s. Big guys, too. It looked like there were a few dozen of them down here. And then there were the various PCs and SBs, all measures of aerial bombs. But the scary thing about them was, they were all open. They had been wired together and connected to what appeared to be some kind of kill switch. I was willing to guarantee they would still detonate if triggered. What many don't know about the German bombs were about 10% of them never exploded. Many, in fact, would be buried under the rubble from other explosions going off. Namely, in England, during the Battle of Britain, the bombs could sit there as some duds but others lie for decades, even being built on top of and not go off but then the slightest vibration just might. I had been given two assistants, who I sent off to begin inspecting the arsenal, pre-diffusing. I just wanted time in here to myself. And so I walked through the aisles, inspecting all the firearms, the bombs, and explosives that had never been used. I was eyeing the Mauser carabiners, the MP40s, the MG42s. It was all a pretty big letdown. These were all old weapons and nothing I wouldn't find in a high school textbook. It was all interesting, but what a disappointment. I picked up one of the Mausers, pulled back the bolt and checked it. Loaded, ready to be fired. I put it back down in the pile of other rifles, but caused them to shift and fall. The whole pile tumbled behind the shelf, knocking a wall panel loose. Miss Sullivan rushed over and found me putting the rifles back onto the shelf. I told him everything was fine and that I had just been a bit clumsy. I went back to looking through the weapon shelves, but the wall panel was stuck in my mind. There was something behind it. Sullivan and the assistants eventually called it a day, so we packed up and went to the dormitory. 
I unpacked and laid in bed for about an hour. All I could think about was the wall panel. What was behind it? I had to know. I snuck out of the dorm and back to the weapons hall. I made my way through the aisles of 12-foot shelves and found the rifles. There was the wall panel. I pushed it inward and found a small ramp that led to a tunnel under the floor. I screw it. I got on my flashlight and crawled into the tunnel. There was just enough room to stand up, and I led back towards the elevator but under it. I followed the path all the way to the end and saw the last thing that I was expecting. There was a door. Old wood. Metal plate and handle. Expensive, classic, and well-crafted. Something you would see in an upper-class hotel. Only abandoned and weathered by time and environment. I fought with myself to open it and decided to. If there was a booby trap, then so be it. I wanted to know. It was a large room that looked like a combination office and library. It was filled with Nazi paraphernalia and old German books and photographs. An oil canvas painting with Hitler hung from the wall. There was a wine rack, an old record player, and a collection of vinyls. Was this to be Hitler's last stand? And did he just never make it here? I thought about cracking one of the hundred-year-old bottles of wine, but decided to avoid eating or drinking anything we didn't bring down with us. Maybe I would sneak one back up, though. I walked towards his desk, curious at what I would find. But my foot caught something on the floor and I trapped. I regained my balance and checked what it was. But there was a latch handle and a metal square that looked a lot like a trap door. It occurred to me then that we were right underneath the elevator. My god, did the hole go deeper? I had assumed that we had hit the bottom. But what if it kept going and this trap door led to it? Curiosity took over and I pulled at the latch, lifting the door. No explosions, no booby traps. There is a short metal staircase leading to a small viewing platform. I climbed down onto it and saw at the far end there is a black iron spiral staircase leading down further. Jesus, how much deeper did this go? I peered over and saw the staircase it didn't drop much further than about 10 feet. Below me was what looked like a large cement floor. It was smooth and encased the entire bottom of the tunnel, going right to the edges of the wall. This was the bottom, I suppose. I had reached it, and I was standing somewhere only one of the most evil men in history had stood. But on the cement floor, there was a large, perfectly rectangular chunk of granite in the center. It reminded me of what you would find in the lid of a sarcophagus, but far thicker. It stood about a meter off the ground. I descended the staircase, keeping focus on the heat and any possible tripwires or explosives, but there weren't any. This place was bare. I stepped down into the cement floor. It wasn't actually cement, but something similar. It looked naturally formed like some kind of heat-absorbing foam that had hardened over the ages. The granite lid was what looked most out of place. It was black, unlike the grayish-white foundation underneath it, and it looked to be over a ton. Why was it sitting perfectly symmetrical in the center of this odd basement? How did they get it down here? Or had it always been here? My mind kept pulling up the image of the lid of a tomb, and some ancient being waiting under it to be brought back which was silly, wasn't it? I approached it, my flashlight catching something on top of the lid. Carvings. There were words chiseled into the granite. I inspected them, but I couldn't make any out. They looked more like symbols from dead language or languages. But at the very center of the block, carved over the other, nonsensical gibberish, was a phrase that I recognized as a modern language. It was hacked into the rock in German. Halle auf Erden. I had no idea what that meant, but I took a mental image of it. Is this where he kept his final weapon? Below his final stand? I put my hand in the rock to test for heat, but found that the mass had shifted under my pressure. The lid moved a few inches from my touch. I applied more pressure and found the rock was easier to move than a piece of paper. 
curious, I decided to shift it further. The lid slid away from me, a loud crack coming from under it like rock breaking. What was revealed under the lid was something I could only describe as a world-changing event. There was a body in a coffin-shaped drop floor. Under the body, rock was cracking and crumbling away, as if cued by the lid opening. The body was a man, and was wearing a 1945 German Chancellor's uniform. He held a Luger in his right hand across his body, and a copy of Mein Kampf in his left. He was old when he had died, in its 80s it looked like, but well preserved. There was no question who it was. He still had his stupid mustache and haircut, though it had grayed during his elder years down here. My mind raised. Was it one of Hitler's doubles that supposedly took the fall for him in Berlin? Or was this one of them? No, this was him. The second that I saw his face, I knew it was him. This is no double. I needed to sit down, but the ground under Hitler's body cracked again, this time splintering and dropping away. Red light from below began to seep up through the rock. The drop floor under him had collapsed and Hitler fell with it. Red light and heat burst through the opening, filling the tunnel. What was down there? I peered over the edge, down through the opening and saw everything I never wanted. I saw fire, brimstone, and writhing masses of bodies clawing at each other. Waves of amber sprayed down on them. I saw erupting volcanoes spewing out more screaming bodies as they were scorched by flames. The fire moved like a living organism, lashing at the bare backs and chests. I saw faceless people burning in vast lakes of boiling water while large winged creatures picked at them from the skies. Miles and miles of it, it was endless. I saw a being in the far, far distance. It stood amidst the erupting volcanoes, taller than any building, whose head disappeared in the dark red clouds above. A sound emerged from it, shaking the bodies and creatures down below. The glass on my protective mask cracked. As if on cue from the being, the bodies and creatures turned their attention up towards me and the opening. They started rushing up towards me, clawing and pulling, anything to get away from the fire and the pain. Another wave of heat hit me. It was immediately unbearable, but I couldn't move. My whole body went full rigor mortis. I stared down, my mask mounting away, into the depths of hell and it stared back up. I got movement back, grabbed the granite lid and tried to slide it over the opening, but it wouldn't budge. I got behind it with all of my weight, but nothing. It was too heavy now. I looked back down and saw the winged creatures flying up towards the opening. The charred bodies of forgotten people were piling on top of each other, creating a mountain of flesh, crawling and gnawing and mashing over one another to reach me and the way out. I saw Hitler skinless and on fire amongst them. I tried to push the lid again, but it was solid and unmoving. It was open now, and it wasn't closing. I rushed back to the staircase, red light and heat filling the chamber. I darted through the tunnel, climbed out of the wall panel and out into the weapons hall. I had to get out. I had to get to the elevator. No time to grab anything. No time to warn anyone. There was no time for anything. I had to get up, and I had to collapse the tunnel from the top, but I had to get out first. As I turned out to the hallway, I saw Ash and Cinder filling the armory behind me. It was coming. I rushed out to the one elevator and saw Sullivan just coming out of the dormitories. He looked confused, like he had just woken up. His eyes went wide when he saw the flames starting to fill the compound. I didn't have time to wait for him or anyone. I shut the gate and punched the elevator up at full blast. We lurched upward and pulled away. I watched Sullivan burst into flames as crowds of burning bodies poured into the hallway, piling onto him. The elevator moved fast. The fire was still down on the bottom level, but it was slowly climbing the elevator shaft. 
I was going to be in this one until the next wedge, which would take 10 minutes. I just hoped that I would make it, and that the metal framing for the elevator would hold out. We made it to the next switch, and I moved fast up through the platforms and onto the second last elevator. This would bring me up to 4 kilometers from the surface, assuming that I made it. As the elevator shot up the tunnel, I watched the platform that I had just been on collapsing into the engulfing flames. Screams echoed up from the ever-growing cloud of fire that filled the tunnel with the reek of sulfur, or as it was previously called, brimstone. I got to the final switch and rushed up to the second platform, but the elevator to go up was gone. They had brought it up. I was stuck here. I looked down and saw the fire rising up the elevator shaft. It couldn't be less than a hundred yards away now. But then I remembered the second tunnel up. It would be tight in four kilometers of cardio, but I would at least survive. But that would take me hours to climb, and the fire would overwhelm the surface long before I got there. Unless I blew the tunnel. That was it. The explosives were on every level, and I had seen them on each switch. It hadn't just been through the mountain. The Germans had prepared for this exact situation. I rushed over to the edge of the tunnel. The heat waves rushing up caused my suit to simmer. My arms burned and I felt the plastic melt into my skin. I bit down and saw the controls for the tunnel explosives. Everything was written in German, but operated similar to the mechanics of a kitchen timer. I quickly set it for one minute and rushed across the platform to the far side of the tunnel. I opened the large metal door to the footpath up and slammed it shut behind me. The footpath up was more like a spiral staircase, minus these stairs and very tight and low, like a twirling crawl space. I was essentially crawling upwards on all fours in an upwards right lane. My arms burned from the plastic, but I try not to pay any attention to them. I felt the explosion go off and the walls pressing my shoulders inward shook. I waited for everything to collapse and cave in on me. I waited for the heat to rise up behind, for the sulfur to fill my nostrils. I kept climbing, waiting for something to stop me, but it didn't. I had no idea how much further it was or how far I had gone. What if somewhere up there it had collapsed? The thought of crawling back was terrifying, but there wasn't anything to crawl back to. I'd have to dig through it all or just give up. The lower tunnel would have collapsed, and with any luck... The final stretch of the elevator shaft would have too. I would know soon enough if they did. I climbed, pulling myself up non-stop for what felt like hours. Time disappeared and then I smelt it. The sulfur. I turned back and caught the faint glow of red drifting up behind me. It was coming up the backup path. I scrambled faster, pulling myself up while the heat behind me got closer. The sulfur became overwhelming and I saw Ambers dancing and jumping behind me. Voices screamed up from the flames, echoing around me. But then there was light up ahead. It was fluorescent, the kind that the military used. I was almost there. I climbed out into the main cavern exhausted. My body drained and empty of energy, but I sprinted through the foliage to the main tunnel out. I got to the first explosive, turned back and saw the fire and bodies spilling out from the pathway. Sullivan was amongst them. He was just barely recognizable, charred to a crisp. He saw me, and a horrific screech bellowed from him. I cranked the timer to 20 seconds and sprinted through the pathway. My only hope was the explosives were still linked together and worked. As I burst out of the tunnel and into the freezing night, an earth-shattering series of explosives shook the ground beneath me, and I was thrown across the frozen landscape by the shockwave. I landed on the snow hard, but got up and kept running. I couldn't feel my arms or legs, and I had fallen into some kind of flow state of movement. I couldn't stop until I was back at the first camp, and on my way to Novo Air Base. I wouldn't sleep until I was on a plane back stateside. I turned back and looked at the mountain that I was just below. 
The mass of rock and granite splintered and had collapsed inward on itself. I hoped that would be enough. The first camp got me on a snowmobile and moved me to the airport. While waiting for my flight, I had my first moments of calm and began dissecting what had happened. The words had carved into the lid. The ones I actually recognized as language haunted me. Halle of Erden. I wrote the words out on a napkin and looked up a translator on my phone. It was indeed German, and it translated to Hell on Earth. So that was it. That was his final weapon. Hitler was going to unleash eternal hell on the rest of us. Or was he? Had he in his elder years decided not to break the barrier? Had he found some kind of peace? Or did he leave himself there to be found someday? so that the discovery of his body could lead to this, and everyone would know who was responsible. I'm not sure that I'll tell anyone, or I'll make something up, like the tunnel became unstable and it caved in. But what if I didn't stop it? I collapsed a mountain on it. I prayed that would be enough to bury it all. But that granite lid, whatever it was, was what separated hell from earth, and it was gone now. I wonder how long it'll take to burn through the mountain and up into our world. The Conspiracy of the Birth of Jesus Written by J. Micafella The following is a letter from Carpus Ben Jehiel to Simon Bad Chemathus the high priest of Judea before Cathiphas. It was found amongst the sea scrolls and has some very interesting content, especially in regards to the fate of St. Joseph the Carpenter. Dearest Simon Bed Camathas, it is I, Carpus Ben Jehiel. It has been quite some time since we last spoke, and hope retirement is treating you kindly. I always told you that Ananas would never lose grip on the high priesthood. I'm sure he worked diligently to dispose of you in favor of his son-in-law. That family, I tell you, they care little for the scriptures. It's all about the power and wealth. I have no doubt that bribes are being accepted by the Roman governor to allow Caiaphas to remain in charge. That unclean serpent of a man Ananas is... That brief year under your leadership as high priest was probably the greatest we have seen since the death of Herod. I pray that I may ever see the glorious days of the Hasmonean again. The purpose of this letter is to not discuss the political situation at the present. That can be saved for another letter, or better, a long overdue meeting. I should come down sometime in the near future. But I fear that what I have learned will prevent me from doing so. The simple lifestyle of the Galleons has charmed me, and it holds me back from returning to the commotion of Judea. If I am to remain here, even if it's the last place I ever see, then I am happy. I pity you, my old friend, that you must stay within that corrupt circle of priests in Jerusalem. I forgot that you are one of the holiest men of our time, and your devotion and love for the scriptures is what holds you there, and I respect you for that. Anyway, the purpose of this letter is in regards to that boy we have encountered in the temple 16 years ago. You know exactly who I speak of, for you are constantly asking me in every letter if I have seen him back home in Galilee. He surely left a great impression upon you. There is actually a great deal of events that have taken place since we last spoke, and they all seem to revolve around this child, or man as he is now. You may be thinking how I can be so certain that this man is the same child. To answer that, I was able to confirm it all with his own mother. But the statements of his father have greatly troubled me. I've decided to write to you to let you decide on what to believe. I can confirm that everything that was stated by his father Joseph has been confirmed by his mother Mary. 
I fear that my recent inquiring of the same knowledge that they hold will put me in great danger. I do not know what will become of me after writing this letter, but its purpose is solely for you to investigate yourself. I know how much this child has taken over your thoughts. His name is Jesus. Let me begin by recounting the event that we both witnessed with the child. It will come into context later on. It was the Passover during the sixth year of Ananus' high priesthood. The festivities had ended and the crowds were starting to disperse from Jerusalem. We were both in the temple doing our daily prayer when we were startled by the presence of a child who was surrounded by a group of five other priests. At the time, we didn't think much of it. Only later did we realize that we had never seen these men before. We were so convinced that we knew them, yet even Ananas could not recall who they were. This will make sense soon. We were both amazed by the knowledge that this child had of the scriptures. It was something that we had never seen in any child before. And the questions that he asked, they were so deep, requiring a well-versed knowledge of the scriptures that even we could not answer some of them. We sat there in the inner temple with the other five priests listening so intently to this child that we paid no heed to the days that had passed us. It wasn't until his mother, Mary, arrived calling out in relief to her son that had startled us back to our senses. She begged the priest not to hurt her son and that she was terribly sorry for neglecting him. None of them said anything to her. The two of us were the only ones who spoke to her and told her of what her son was doing and how amazed we were by his knowledge of the scripture. We couldn't believe it when she told us that he had been here for three days. It was certain that it had only been an hour at the most. And I don't know about you, but I never forgot the look of horror that the father Joseph had upon his face when he saw his son amongst us all. It was strange, because between the moment that she had startled us, until she had her son and left the temple, the other five priests had vanished. No trace of them was that there at all. No doubt this had plagued your mind ever since, and I'm going to provide you with some closure on that. Like you, the strange phenomenon had never left my mind, and it was what brought me to Galilee in the first place. Forgive me for telling you this now, but I had found Jesus a lot earlier than you should have been told. A lot earlier. You see, not long before you became high priest, I moved to the town of Nazareth where I reunited with my sister's family, and there I remained preaching in the synagogue there. This would be where I found the family again. They would pray at the synagogue quite frequently and I began to get to know them. Mary was a truly beautiful woman, of both looks and charity. Joseph was a hard-working, caring father, who seemed to hold some sort of weight on his shoulders that he had been failing to hide. It was obvious to me, and I wanted to learn more about him. I stayed in Nazareth ever since, growing closer and closer with the family, getting to know this child who was a remarkable human. He was one of the most kind, gentle, and knowledgeable people that I had ever met. I was constantly blown away by some of the things that he had said. No young man should have such wisdom. Strangely enough, the same thing was occurring up here in Nazareth as it did to us in the temple. The strange presence of other people who I was certain that I knew, only for them to vanish from sight upon being startled. I couldn't explain it and I tried to study in it subtly when it did occur. But it was like my mind could simply not comprehend the event. As much as I tried to deny my accusations, my mind would always reassure me that the people were actually there, and I did know them. This happened many times when Jesus was in the synagogue, and I had no doubt that it happened even more when I was not around. This began to trouble me so much that I decided to ask Joseph about it, and whether he could confirm to me what this strange phenomenon was that I wasn't quite able to understand yet. Joseph looked at me in shock when I asked him. 
I don't know what you're talking about, Carpes. That sounds absurd. He would reply to me. I was sure by the tone of his voice that this was not the case and that he was actually aware of it too, but just didn't want to say so. I began to give up on trying to come up with an explanation to these strange appearances of people around Jesus. It was frustrating me so much that I decided to leave Nazareth for Tiberias just to clear my head and get some nice breeze from the Sea of Galilee. Now we come to the events of the past few months. I was making a sacrifice in the Tiberius synagogue when I was interrupted by the huffing and puffing of one who had ran a marathon. It was Joseph. He was holding a sack containing some items within it. He fell to his knees in front of my startled self and he wept. Oh, Carpus, I should have told you. I should have told you at all. But I fear it's too late now. It's happened. What the angel said has finally come to pass. The boy is dead, he sobbed. Dead, I exclaimed in startlement. The thought of one so blessed as Jesus being dead was greatly shocking. How? What has happened, Joseph? I lifted Joseph to his feet and tried comforting him in his hysterics. Where is Mary? Is she coping all right? I asked him. Joseph shook his head in denial. It's all her fault. That harlot. I was moved by pity at seeing a man act in such a way. Joseph, please tell me everything. Joseph began. Mary conceived of Jesus outside of wedlock. My eyes widened upon hearing this. That was a true scandal. She must surely have been blessed to escape stoning for such a treacherous act to her betrothed. She was seeing another man at the time and ended up pregnant with him not long after we had become engaged. It was hard because I truly loved her and I didn't want her to be stoned. I tried to divorce her silently, even as the resentment to her began to grow. But then I was stopped in my tracks by some angels. They were terrifying to behold, and they held me at knife point and ordered me not to divorce Mary and to call the child my own. They told me that there was a great plan installed for the child, and I was to help see it come to pass. More so out of fear of their divine wrath, I accepted out of fear of my life, and I remained married to Mary. We ended up going all the way to Bethlehem to have the child. Once Mary gave birth, a great and almighty star was risen above the location of where we were. It was unlike anything I had ever seen before, yet no one who was present at the place of birth could recall such a star. The star was not intended for human eyes. Rather, a coalition of angels arrived at the stable, dressed in the disguises of shepherds and three wise men of the east. The three of the east were the most powerful of the angels, and they provided three gifts for Jesus. These gifts had some sort of special power, and I had no doubt that they were to play a large role in their eventual plans. I know not when they are to happen, but I am certain that the time has come. Joseph handed me the bag that he was carrying. Inside was some frankincense, myrrh, and gold. I studied them. These are those gifts, Joseph said. I immediately put them back into the bag and handed it back to Joseph. I don't want to be involved in this, Joseph, I said. Joseph shook his head in denial before forcing it in my hands. I have no choice, Carpus. You are the only one that I can trust. You are the only one who has seen the angels firsthand. Firsthand? What was he talking about? I'm sorry, I may be a holy man, but I have never been given the privilege of seeing one of those Lord's angels. I said to him. I was starting to think that he was a madman. Yes, you have, he shouted back. You saw them at the temple all those years ago. You have also seen them throughout Jesus' life. Don't you understand? That strange phenomena you were troubled by was the angels coming to rear Jesus further, disguised as people letting off the impression that you knew them. 
You truly are wise, for you were the only one to question and see through this guise, it seems. Alas, I had some sort of explanation as to what the strange experience was, but I was still skeptical. Why couldn't you have told me this when I asked, instead of shutting me off like you did? I asked sternly. Because you would have killed me if I told you then. Now, I have nothing left to lose. I was getting annoyed and fearful at the same time with Joseph's remarks. Joseph, I demand an explanation to this sudden desperateness. What happened to Jesus? Joseph took a deep breath and continued. The angels have been rearing Jesus all these years for their plan, and that plan was to make him become an extremely faithful and powerful young man, so powerful that a part of God was able to enter into him when the bridge between faith can be made. That occurred last week when Jesus went to John the Baptist to be baptized. I had heard of a homeless prophet in the desert preaching of the coming Messiah, but never thought anything of it, other than another rabid claimer of the Essenes. At the moment John lifted him from the water, the boy that I had once known was no more. He was dead, but in his shell there was the presence of another. It was the presence of God. After the ceremony, he came to me and Mary. He was followed by a large number of angels who were no longer in their human disguises. He told us that he was going into the desert to speak with his enemy. Upon returning, he told Mary that he would take the three gifts and begin the great conversion. They then left. I immediately felt a huge weight lift from my shoulders. I was freed from the oath of fear that I made to the angels. The child was reared, and now the angels had him for themselves. I had nothing left to do. I made plans to officially divorce Mary and return to Jerusalem to be far away from the lie that I had been living. It's funny because I didn't even return home with Mary that evening. I had already made my mind up in my heart, and I went straight to my family in Gamala leaving Mary to go alone to Nazareth. But my newfound freedom was quickly restrained when I came face to face with another angel. This angel seemed different to the others, and he was in some sort of desperation. I wasn't able to get his name, but he told me that God's plan was not what it seemed. The three gifts needed to be taken far away so that the angels and Jesus could not use them. There was a great power bestowed onto them that no angel can possess in their natural form. Only a human could hold. This angel told me that the situation was dire and that I had to take the three gifts and get rid of them as quickly as I could. He told me that when Jesus would return from the desert, I was likely to be killed, so this was the only opportunity to do it. I was the only one who knew other than Mary and was the only hope of putting a wound in the plans of God. I hate to admit it to you, Carpus, but I am vengeful to God. Vengeful for taking nearly 30 good years of my life away from me. How dare they hold a knife to my throat and force me into assisting their plans. Force me to assist in the cover-up of an unfaithful woman who should have been stoned. I did just as the angel had said and I took the three gifts and here they are now. Joseph looked desperately into my eyes. They will arrive in Nazareth soon, and will begin searching for these gifts. I'll be dead soon, but they will not know that you have them. I don't care what you do with them, but you need to take them. Do whatever you think is best, but just know that they will be looking for them. Now please, let me retire and enjoy the last few days of my life before they find me. And with that, Joseph left the synagogue, leaving me stunned and lost for words. I didn't know if I should believe him or not, but even if it was as severe as he had made it out to be, I sure did not want to get involved in it now. I hid the three gifts in my residence inside my bedroll and I made my way to Nazareth to speak to Mary and see if she could confirm what Joseph had told me. Upon arriving at the house that I had become all too familiar with, I was met by the ghost of the former beauty that Mary was. She had aged drastically, 
and it seemed that sorrow had shrouded her. Mary, where is Joseph? I asked her, to see if she would provide any hint at his running off. Mary turned around and smiled half-heartedly. He's gone. He came to his senses and left the harlot that I am. I was greatly moved by this and went to comfort her as she began to weep over the window. You are no harlot, Mary. You are a caring, devoted mother who has reared an amazing son. You should be proud of his achievements. I said to her, I am proud of him and I truly love him. But how can I live this lie any longer? The angels promised to cover up my treachery. If I allowed them to use my son for their purposes... She looked deep into my eyes and said words that I would never forget. What mother would sacrifice their child to cover up their sins? She continued to burst into tears. I saw Joseph. I began. He told me everything. Do you believe it? Do you really think that your son is gone? Mary closed her eyes as she half-heartedly nodded. In my mind... I know their plan has come to pass and my son is gone. All that remains is a shell for the Lord to reside in. In my heart, my boy is still alive though, and I can't accept that he's no longer the child I knew. At that moment, we were both startled by the presence of a man entering into the room. Woman, I have returned, they said. It was Jesus. Mary immediately ran to the shell of her son and wrapped her arms around him. Jesus just stood there stoically and fixed his gaze upon me. Who is this man? He said in a very authoritative voice. Don't you remember? Mary began. This is Carpus Ben Jehiel, the priest who used to visit us when you were younger. Jesus cared little for me and moved away from his mother and went to search for the three gifts. He looked around the room, where he knew that it was, but nothing could be seen. Woman, where are the gifts? Jesus asked as he came closer to Mary. He was looking very angered. I don't know, Jesus. They should have been here. I haven't touched them since you were a boy, as the angels instructed. Liar, he shouted. Where are they? Mary was stuttering as she was genuinely trying to tell him the truth. Jesus reached for her throat and began to squeeze tightly, while Mary began to gasp for air. Where are the gifts? I was afraid of Jesus and had accepted that what Joseph and Mary were saying was true. Perhaps it would have been divine justice for Mary to have been slain by the being who inhabited her son's form, a being whose presence was ensured by her own selfish deed of sacrificing her own son to cover up her sin. But I knew she was a pitious woman, and I was not going to stand by and watch her be murdered. I felt great pity for Joseph, but he told me that his life was officially about to end. It was the only way. Joseph has them, I shouted to Jesus. Upon hearing this, he immediately released Mary from his grasp and vanished without a trace. I ran to Mary and comforted her. I told her that she had to leave and I was willing to bring her with me, but she adamantly refused and told me, This is my house and that is still my son. I can't let him go. I knew that she was delirious and in denial of the truth, but I couldn't waste any more time with her. I had to rid myself of these three gifts and fast. I trusted that Joseph would not reveal the location to Jesus so I had time to get rid of them fast. I sent the gold off to the wealthy Longinus family back in Rome, a family who was renowned for the prestige and many expensive trinkets. The frankincense has gone down to Mariantania, to some Jewish Berbers that I know of. And last of all, the myrrh. I have attached to this letter for you, Simon. Keep it secret and keep it safe. Do not let anyone know about it unless you trust them. I'm sorry that I brought you into this, but... I trust you deeply and you need to understand that there is something powerful happening that we are the scriptures cannot explain. Whatever this great conversion is, I fear that may be something that we should potentially work against. Part of me hopes that the angel whom Joseph had spoken to was telling the truth, 
because part of me thinks that it could have been Satan, and we very well could be hindering God's plans. Either way, I have chosen my path and made my decision. Whether it will cost my life, I'll find out very soon. I want you to decide for yourself what you believe, Simon. I don't want you to be forced into a decision that could very well be the wrong one. You need to decide for yourself. I gave you the myrrh because if you find merit to Jesus, and he turns out to be on the right side of this whole conflict, I want you to return it to him. I would imagine the praise that he would give you. But if you deem him to be wrong and I and Joseph are correct, then hide the myrrh with all your strength. Go and find John the Baptist. He is somewhere in the wilds, but he shouldn't be hard to find. He has not stopped praising Jesus since he had baptized him. Sooner or later, he will get himself into trouble with the authorities. So make haste. Find him and find out for yourself if this is the truth. But keep your head down, dear Simon, and make sure that you're as certain before jumping to whatever conclusion you make. Forgive me if what I wrote may seem sacrilegious. I'm only telling you what I saw and what I have learned. Stay safe, my dear friend, and for the last time, farewell. I work as a security guard for a company that takes jobs and no one else will. Written by Rickon Dickon Dockin 123. I've been a security guard in my company for over two years now, but the work that my company does is not your typical run of the mill. To put it simply, my company accepts jobs which no other security company will. That includes high risk assignments which often result in loss of staff members or abandoning their post. Let me take it from the top. When I started working here, they had a very long one-on-one -on -one with me to explain all the potential dangers that I would be facing. They also made me sign an NDA and a bunch of other papers which stated that if something were to happen to me, the company would not be held responsible. They explained that the job is risky, but also paid well. I had been jobless for a while and jumped at the opportunity regardless of the risk. Unlike most other companies though, they made me read through the entire NDA aloud and made sure that I was aware of all the rules. Some of the things that I read there made me think initially that this was all a joke, but then I saw that my superior was really serious. My job would basically be to provide support to the guards at other posts via comms and patrol the perimeter that I was stationed at. Now, our HQ was located in an office building compound which had multiple companies renting the adjacent buildings. I would mostly work nights with the occasional morning, and the rules were as follows. I was to do a full sweep of the compound in all offices, save for building 4 and the call center office. I was not to approach building 4 under any circumstances, no matter what I heard from the outside. Even if I saw someone inside from the windows, I was not to engage. When I asked for more details, they refused to answer me, stating that I should simply obey their orders if I value my life. Now people have a normal 9-5 to -five job, in that building and nothing seems to be wrong during the daytime. When I do ask the employees about during my morning shifts though, they all seem to either not know anything or abruptly find an excuse to end the conversation. For Building 6, the designer company, the rules were even stranger. Here's what the chief told me. In Building 6, you may sometimes run into someone, a woman to be precise. She's going to try to start a conversation with you. It is imperative that you ignore her presence at all costs. She will try to talk to you, taunt you, but she will never get in your way. An extremely important rule to remember, and I cannot stress this enough, is that if you see her in the building, don't run or exit the building before finishing your sweep. Trust me, she'll know. And do the sweep as you normally would. Check every room and then quietly exit, ignoring her all the way. She will become increasingly agitated and violent, and might even try to startle you, tell you that there is something behind you in a very convincing manner. 
just ignore her. If you don't well, you don't want to know what happened to the last guard. I've since encountered the woman once and it was a grueling and agonizing experience that I would rather not talk about. Another rule that I had to remember was not opening the gate between the hours of 22 and 07. The chief said that under no circumstances I might open the gate. Even if the next guard comes five minutes earlier to relieve me of my duty, the gate was to remain closed. And that brings me to the experience that I had once. It was about six months after I started working and the sun was already almost up. I heard knocking on the gate and when I went out, I saw through the gate the silhouette of my coworker. Hey, mind opening the gate? He had asked. As I approached and put my keys into the keyhole, my phone started ringing. I answered it without even looking at the caller. But when I heard the voice, my blood froze. It was my coworker. Hey, I'm gonna be about 30 minutes late today. Sorry, man. I hung up and then realized that it was 6.50 a.m. I stared at the silhouette on the other side of the gate, who suddenly started banging on the door, demanding to be let in, stating that he had lost his cell phone and that he was the real coworker. I retreated to the guardhouse and waited for what seemed like forever until the banging stopped. In reality, it only lasted until 7 a.m. Those were all the rules that I had to follow on my own post and most of the time, it's uneventful. However, I've heard stories from other coworkers. Since I'm in contact with guards at other pose, one of them told me this story. He had worked as a guard in a residential building in one night. An old man who lived there called him to come to his apartment. He didn't explain what was wrong, just told him to go there and so he did. When he had reached the apartment, the wife of the old man was crying stating that her husband was dead. The guard tried convincing her that her man was very much alive and had in fact brought him there. But when he turned around, the old man was gone. It was then that he saw the old man's body in his chair next to his sobbing wife. He quit the same night. Another creepy thing that happened was on a farmstead which our company has guards posted on. A guy by the name of Jeff who worked there told me about his own experience which made him run away from his post in at the middle of the night. So apparently the farm was empty at that time since it needed some more stuff built first. But his duty was to basically patrol circles around the farm and make sure that there were no squatters or vandals. So one night as he's walking around he hears someone calling his name in a playful tone. He dismisses it as his imagination at first. But when it recurs, he asks who's there and demands that they show up with their hands in the air. Now, I haven't seen this, so I can't guarantee anything, but Jeff swears that it's true. He says all of a sudden, out of the crops, a man just stands up. At the top of the crops, it reached to his waist, which was technically impossible, because the crops themselves were taller than Jeff, and he's a pretty tall guy. But the man grins at Jeff and continues calling his name playfully, as if he's still hiding from him. Needless to say, Jeff didn't stick around to see what that guy wanted. And when he reported it to HQ, they said that there were sightings of that man in the past, always calling the names of the guards but never really doing anything harmful. And the final thing that I'll share with you here is my experience when I was stationed at a hospital for one month. It was a private clinic of some sorts and my job was to basically monitor the camera feed. Camera 3 was off though and when I asked why, they told me to keep it that way and never turn it on. They also said that from time to time I may see a person on the feed which covered the outside of the security office and that he would just be standing there facing the door. I was to remain in my office when that happened and not glance at the door. He would usually disappear after about 30 minutes or so, and patrolling was strictly prohibited between the hours of 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. Money is one of the reasons why I haven't quit so far, and the dangers aren't that bad once you get used to them and you know what you're doing. And plus getting stationed at a different posts keeps the job adventurous and dynamic. If any of you lack any special talents or qualifications like me, this job is perfect for you. So, a lot of you are asking to hear more about my job and the duties that come along with it. 
I'll be sharing in this post more about the stories that I have and what I heard from the other guards. I know you wanted to know more about the woman in building number 6, so I'll be sharing my experience with that first. This happened about a year ago, but I still dread going back to the building every time during my patrol. I was doing a sweep of the building using my flashlight to illuminate my path. As I was done checking one of the offices, I turned around, and my heart nearly popped out of my chest at what the beam of my flashlight had landed on. It was a woman in her late twenties, with unkempt hair and raggedy clothing. She was just standing there, staring at me, not even flinching at the light in her face. I was about to talk to her, thinking she was a squatter, completely forgetting about the rule since I had never once encountered her by then. And then, when I remembered the rules, that I was supposed to ignore her, my heart started to thump fast. I lowered my flashlight to my waist, pretending that I was looking at something on the wall to prevent her from seeing my beam bouncing up and down from my trembling hand. I remembered that I had to do a full sweep before leaving if she was here and I was only done with one floor. So with the thought of this, I cursed in my mind. Hey, I'm sorry, I think I fell asleep in one of the offices and stayed after closing. She said, but I ignored her. I pretended to look around some more, but knew that I could only do it for so long before she got suspicious. So I decided to test my luck and just went for the door. As soon as I was inches close to her, she stepped aside and let me move along. I strode to the next office but heard her following me right behind me. Hey, can you please let me out? My children have to be worried sick, she repeated. The next 15 minutes or so, she was breathing down my neck, constantly trying to grab my attention. As I entered one of the offices, she pointed to the corner opposite of where my beam was and said, Hey, who's that over there? I fought the urge to look there, knowing that she was lying, but half scared that someone would have just jump me right around the corner. As I progressed with my sweep, she became increasingly irritated, throwing stuff in my direction, not at me, mind you, but trying to startle me, but throwing them right in front of my face. Suddenly jumping on my walking path with a louder scream before moving aside again, clasping her hands over her mouth and pointing behind me with wide eyes, which screamed utter fear, even saying things like, I know you can see me, and I know you know I'm here. I can see how scared you are. I ignored all of it as much as I could, and by the time I was back on the first floor, more than ready to get out, she was saying things like, Are you sure you checked all the rooms? Giggling along the way. I put the key in the keyhole and everything went quiet. I didn't want to see if she was gone, but instead I just went out as calmly as I could and locked the door behind me. I couldn't sleep for weeks after that one. A few months ago, I was stationed at an old office building. At first, it seemed like a common job, but I knew that there was a catch before I even signed up. Sure enough, I was right. My partner and I were stationed on floor 43, which was undergoing renovations. Our job was to simply stand in front of a door. The door had a card reader and we were given access, but we were strictly forbidden from entering. People in hazmat suits would be coming in and out all day long from 8am to 4pm, and we were to let them in and out whenever they pleased, keeping track of the number of people who came and went. Now the catch was, after 1600 hours, we were ordered not to let anyone in or out. That meant even if someone knocked on the door at 1601, we were to ignore them entirely. There would always be at least three people who would try to leave the room after 1600 hours, always asking politely and becoming increasingly desperate, saying that they had simply lost track of time and they would plead with us, saying that their family was waiting for them at home. We always ignored their crying and pleading, no matter how desperate it was, until it turned into whimpers and then finally stopped. Now, I've only seen the room from the door and from what I could see. It was just a normal room undergoing renovation like the rest of the floor. So whatever was in there must have been deeper inside or hidden in plain sight. As for the numbers that we tracked, 
The number of people who got out by the end of the day was always lower than the number of people who went in. One story, a guard named Chris told me about his time in an old mansion guarding a big mirror. He and his co-worker were in the security room patrolling every hour, especially making sure that the mirror was covered with the sheet. They were to, under no circumstances, look at the mirror. They had a camera feed of the mirror which was on the bottom floor under the stairs, but it was turned so that the reflective side faced away from the camera. This one night, Chris's co-worker goes for a patrol and as he enters the mirror room, suddenly the sheet just slides off. Now the guy who told me this said it was technically impossible for the sheet to just to come off, because it was fastened tightly, but somehow it did and his partner just finds himself staring at the mirror. And Chris locks the security room, as per the instructions from HQ, and calls the intervention team. Meanwhile, he glances back at the camera feed, only to find his co-worker still staring blankly in the mirror. He had thought the camera was frozen, but the timer was moving, so his partner was just very still. He tried radioing him, but there was no response. And after about a minute or so, all of a sudden his partner pulls out his gun, puts it into his mouth, and finishes the job. Chris was transferred the next day since a special team was sent to secure the mirror, and his services were no longer needed. One position that everyone is massively trying to apply for is the surveillance officer in a small town close to my own. Why they want the position is what I'll get to in a bit, but basically the camera feed and the monitors in HQ over there cover various private households. One of the households had said to have a man in a suit show up at the doorstep from time to time. Now usually, guards need to go out to the address and make sure that everything is okay, or to apprehend the intruder. But for this specific individual, HQ left a very unique guide. Here are the instructions left by HQ. If the security official notices an individual in business attire on camera 12 during a shaft, the steps below must be followed when confronting the individual. 1. Approach the individual and wait for him to turn around. He will continue to smile for the entirety of the conversation, but should his expression change, disengage and run to safety as quickly as possible. Be advised that while firearms are not prohibited, they are highly ineffective against the individual. Do not turn or look away from the individual once he has turned around unless you need to evacuate. 2. The individual will, after turning it around, inquire. Lovely night, isn't it? If the individual has not yet asked this question, follow the previous step and evacuate. 3. If the individual has inquired the aforementioned question, respond with, Yes, it is. What can I do for you? Or, indeed it is. How can I help you? A combination of both works as well. If the individual ceases to smile during this interaction, proceed to evacuate immediately. 4. If done correctly, the individual will now ask, Can you sing me a song? If he says anything else, evacuate. 5. From here, you are to sing the pre-taught song to the individual, while ignoring his taunts and distractions. If so much as one word, pause or tone or stress are missed, Evacuate. If the individual stops smiling during the song, evacuate. 6. If done correctly, the individual will say, Splendid, thank you for the beautiful song. If he says anything aside from that, evacuate. 7. If step 6 was done correctly, close your eyes for at least 10 seconds and then open them. On the front steps where the individual stood will now be a briefcase, containing a large sum of money. While the individual himself will be gone and the household safe. 8. On the way back, the security official may encounter people of various ages in dire need of help. Most common occurrences include starving women with newborn babies, lost children, an attractive young woman hitchhiking, etc., they are to be ignored and not offered assistance under any circumstances. 9. 
return to post and turn off the camera 12. Note, the company does not claim the reward from the individual. Therefore, the security official is free to keep it. The high risk, high reward position makes it attractive to many people, but most of them never live to tell the tale. I was also told that the candidates go through rigorous training, focusing primarily on sprinting. The candidates also need to pass the test which simulates the encounter with the businessman, no less than five times with a 95% or higher score. They are forced to remember the song perfectly, going through a computerized scanner which detects any notes which were off. I don't even know what the song is, but I was told it's a simple tune which sounds like something taught in preschool. Anyway, this is as far as I'll go on this post, but I have some more stories to share in my future updates. In the meantime, stay safe and try to stay away from these kinds of things. They sound attractive due to pay or rush some people thrive on, but a tiny mistake can cost you your life. Or worse. Here are some more stories about places that I was stationed at and the ones that I heard from other guards in the company. A lot of these guards aren't around anymore and I reckon the same could happen to me at any moment on my shaft. So, if in case there's a lack of updates, most likely something's happened to me. So, one memorable experience that I've had and not in a good way was when I was stationed at a local park with another guard. The park wasn't too big, had a playground, a running track which wound in a circle around the park itself and a tennis court. Everywhere else around were thick trees so following the running track gave a very convincing impression of being in a forest, away from civilization. My coworker and I were to start our shift in the park at 7pm and it would end at 7am. There was a tiny guardhouse near the entrance which we could spend most of our shift in and every two hours we would go patrolling around the park, very strictly following the running track where the path was illuminated. We were given a heavy-duty flashlight and a backup torch in case the main one runs out of power. HQ issued an order that if we found any burnt-out light on our path, we were to retreat to the guardhouse immediately and let maintenance know about it in the morning. Under no circumstances were we to step into the dark patch of the track, this one night, I was doing my rounds around the park when all of a sudden, I heard my partner's voice. He simply shouted, Hey, help me, from a distance. I couldn't tell where it was coming from, so I called it to him, moving my beam across the trees beyond the path. Now, the light that we were given is able to penetrate darkness so well that you could see it at least 100 meters in front of you. But when I illuminated the area my partner's voice was coming from, there was nothing. Moreover, the voice seemed to change the positions that it was coming from. He yelled again, Hey, help me! And I called him once more, asking him to tell me where he was at, but there was no response. I didn't dare wander into the darkness, especially with no signs of him anywhere, heavy-duty light or not. And then my partner yelled for help again and I realized something which made the hairs at the back of my neck stand straight. His cries for help were on a loop, always saying the same thing, the same intonation, and the same length of pauses. I even looked at my watch and sure enough, I was right. Call for help. Eight second pause. Call for help. Eight seconds again. I then realized how suddenly quiet everything was. Usually the park was somewhat loud at night. Crickets, owls, etc., now it was so silent that I could hear my own heartbeat thumping. I turned around very slowly and walked out of there, doing my best not to sprint at my partner's looping cries for help persisted almost halfway until I was back at the guardhouse. When I finally did get back, my suspicion was confirmed and my partner was there, visibly confused at what I had just told him. When we called up HQ to report suspicious activity and in no less than five minutes, a vehicle pulled up to the entrance. An intervention unit emerged which was essentially an armored and heavy armored team ascending case of emergencies. I was questioned by the team leader for the next hour, while the others went to the scene where I had heard the voice of my coworker. My partner and I were escorted out of the place and the following morning, 
We were told that the part contract was voided by the company, and we no longer needed to go there. I don't know anything else, though, because right after it, I returned to my original post back at HQ. I spoke to a former intervention unit member who had worked for a company for over five years. He said that some of the stuff he had seen was unimaginable and he was willing to share some with me. For instance, this one time they got a call from a residential building that they were securing that there were strange noises coming from one of the rooms. The team arrived in the scene and questioned the guard who had reported the incident. Apparently his job was to make sure that no one entered room 416. He explained that the room itself was unoccupied, but that noises would be heard constantly between 2 a.m. and 3 a.m. Usually, those noises would include childlike giggling, loud footsteps, bouncing off something on the floor, and so on. The residents learned to ignore the noises, but this one old lady, Mrs. Rogers, had managed to get in, which she saw on the camera feed. Now the intervention unit was told not to go in after anyone after 20 minutes had passed. But they still had time so they rushed to the room. The guy who was telling me this said that as they approached the room they heard voices. Like a group of people trying to talk in a hushed tone. They explained that it sounded like kids in school when they're trying to whisper. But were unintentionally loud enough for others to hear. As soon as they had touched the doorknob, the voices all stopped in unison. Not like the conversation was over, like literally as if someone had pressed a mute button in the middle of a sentence. They burst inside the empty room which looked like no one stepped inside for years, weapons raised. No one was there, and as they're standing there completely silent, they hear a barely audible wheezing sound from above. They all look up and as they do, they freeze. The guy who told me this said that what he saw still keeps him up at night sometimes. Mrs. Rogers was standing in the ceiling like a spider on all fours, craning her neck so much they thought her neck was broken, and she was looking directly at the unit upside down, wide-eyed. Spit was occasionally dropping from her mouth to the floor as she was wheezing. Her fingers had somehow mutated into long claws. And then, without any warning, Mrs. Rogers had managed to jump down on one of the team members in the blink of an eye, and gunshots ensued. He said that by the time they were done shooting, two more members were down and Mrs. Rogers had hundreds of bullet holes in her body, and was no longer moving. He had encountered similar scenarios after that, but never came so close to dying again. The building residents were evacuated from the building indefinitely the next day, and the official story given was that there was toxic fungi located within the building. The final story that I'll share here is going to be the one I was told by another guard who went missing later on. He was stationed at a private school and it had a set of very strict rules that they had to follow. First off, there were 10 guards in total in each shift and each of them were assigned to a classroom. Their job was to count all of the students after the classes were over should any of the students go missing, they were to call HQ immediately. And now comes the weird part. One day, the guard who told me this story counted all the kids in class and the final number wouldn't add up. Instead of 32 students, he had 33. He counted a few times to make sure and when the number was confirmed at 33, he told the teacher to start calling them by name and separating them from the group one by one. The teacher does so, calling each and every student. But when they're done, there are no surpluses. The list showed 32 and 32 were called on and yet 33 students were in the classroom. They couldn't tell you who the extra student was even when the guard was watching them like a hawk to make sure. None of them would sneak to the group of called on kids while they weren't looking. Baffled and unsure of what to do, the guy tells the teacher to keep an eye on them while he contacts HQ. Already feeling silly for contacting the higher-ups over an extra student rather than a missing one, he expected HQ to scold him for calling about something like that. But when he says that he is an extra student who just popped up, chuckling at the absurdity of the situation, the person on the other end of the line suddenly goes silent. She asked him to repeat what he had said and when he does, the woman tells him to get the teacher out of there, lock the classroom immediately, and radio everyone else to do the same at once. 
He does so, and only a minute later, the intervention unit arrives, escorting the guards out of there. He said that he had no idea what happened next, but when he returned to the school the next day for his shift, everything seemed to be normal. No one really knows what the company is dealing with here. Not even intervention was told what these encounters are, since it seems to be a very strict need-to-know basis. One thing is for sure, though. When I hear some of these stories from other guards, I realize how lucky I got to run into some of these creatures and live to tell the tale. But I want to start off by clarifying one thing before I start. The company I work for is not the SCP. I know there are a lot of similarities between the encounters which I described in some of the SCP files, but my company has nothing to do with that. We are just, as I had stated before, a standalone security company that provides technical security, surveillance, and physical protection services to clients. Now, I'm going to begin this post with a story that still runs at chills down my spine. While I was stationed at an office complex similar to the ones in HQ where I am now, I had a number of strange experiences. Our job was mostly staying in our guardhouse and conducting mandatory patrols around the complex at the start and at the end of the shift, him taking one side while I took the other. A few months back, I came to my shift as usual with my partner. So on that day, we finished our initial patrol and returned back to the guardhouse. And we usually talked to pass the time, but this time he seemed unapproachable and quiet so I figured I should leave him alone and continue to read my book for the time being. Our shift was almost over when we decided to do our final sweep, so we split up to do our rounds. After I was done, I came back, but my partner wasn't there. I figured he wasn't done with his sweep yet, so I shrugged it off and continued passing the time. When he wasn't back in over 30 minutes, though, I radioed him. No response. He was nowhere on the cameras either. Figuring that he may be in trouble, I went out to search for him, frustrated that he wasn't back and it was almost the end of our shaft. As I'm patrolling, I see him in the distance across the parking lot, turned away from me and looking at something. I called out his name and he turned around. I waved to him, telling him to get back and he waved back to me. I took it as a signal that he understood what I had said and he returned to the guardhouse. The guys from the next shift were already there and I went home, telling them that my partner would do the debriefing. Not two hours later, I got a phone call from these same guys. They told me my partner never showed up, so they went looking for him, thinking that something may have been wrong. Sure enough, soon after they started the search, he was found dead. I was shocked to say the least. I asked them when he had died and how, and since I had seen him literally minutes before they had arrived, and they told me that it was impossible for me to have seen him. I asked them why, and the answer they gave me chilled me to the bone. Apparently, he had died about 10 hours ago, and the camera recordings had confirmed it. He was seen wandering off camera into the garage and then never seen coming out. One of the guys discovered his body there. No visible wounds or marks on him. HQ recovered his body, but shared no details about the cause of his death. So, that begs the question. If he died 10 hours ago, who did I see in that parking lot? And moreover, who in heck's name was with me in the guardhouse for 10 hours between patrols? In that same place, in addition to our patrol around the complex, we also had to check inside of buildings and make sure that everything was alright. So one time on my shift, I'm in one of the office buildings doing my sweep on the second floor, and I move to the stairs to get to the next floor. I climb up and as I do, I see that the sign on the wall says, second floor again. I dismiss it, thinking that I must have been the first floor prior to this and I had just gotten confused. I move up one floor and again, and the sign says, second floor. I stare at the sign in bafflement and decide to try the door. Locked. I climb up one more floor and again, I'm on the second floor. I knew by this point that something was wrong. 
I mean, the building itself is only three floors and I had already climbed at least four. I decided to descend the stairs as fast as I could, but every time I passed by the floor sign it said a second floor. I ran until I was exhausted, trying doors along the way, all of which were locked. I leaned over the railing to look down the stairs and I saw the staircase going down infinitely into a black abyss, same for the above. I radioed my partner but there was no response, no signal on the phone either. I decided to sit down and think about everything, already half accepting my impending demise. It must have been hours there that I sat and ran down the stairs and admittedly, when I suddenly heard the sound of the door opening below. I was so relieved to actually hear something besides my own footsteps that I didn't even think about the potential dangers that it might entail. I rushed down into my relief, I saw these signs for floor one, the door open as I had left it when I had entered the building. I bolted out of there and straight to the guardhouse, barging in through the door. My coworker was there reading the newspaper, only shooting me a glance before returning to his reading. When I accused him of not answering his radio, he looked confused, stating that he had never got a call from me. I asked him why he hadn't looked for me when I hadn't returned in hours and again, he looked confused. He glanced at his watch and then at me and simply said, You've been gone for five minutes. HQ issued a rule after that. The office building was off limits for all personnel after 8pm. One time during my shift, as I was finishing my patrol, I could hear my coworker's voice in the distance. He sounded like he was in distress, so I followed the sound, calling out his name. As I approached the source of the voice, it became obvious that my coworker was in the looping building, begging me to help him. I drew my gun and told him to hold on, ready to risk my life for my partner and just as I was about to enter, I heard his voice behind me calling my name. I turned around and sure enough there he was. Looking back at the building and the cries from the person in the building had stopped completely. The coworker confirmed that it wasn't him who was in the building and as I turned back to the source of the voice, I could only mutter to myself, you sneaky son of a... One thing that happened to one of the other guys during one of the shifts still puts me on edge. This guy named Chris was in the guardhouse with his partner and the partner decided to go for a patrol earlier. Chris continued reading his book as the partner left the place. One minute later, he heard the door shut behind him and the thud of his footsteps of his partner inside. Forgot something, huh? He had asked, not looking up from his book. The partner put his hand on Chris's shoulder and Chris raises his head, ready to turn around. As he does, he sees his coworker pass next to the window outside. Chris froze, staring at the window, at the reflection of the figure standing behind him. He says that he felt the grip on his shoulder tightening, bracing himself as well as he could. He swiftly turned around, drawing his gun and pointing it at nothing. No one was there. I checked the recordings of the camera feed in the guardhouse and sure enough, no one was there with him. I could see Chris and the camera sitting up, visibly becoming tense and turning around with his gun drawn before, looking around and finally holstering the weapon. He looked like a crazy person from this angle. I never figured what that was or the other occurrences in the complex, but HQ issued new orders shortly after. The guards who were on the shift were to stay together at all times, even patrolling in pairs and communicating via code sentences every 30 minutes to ensure their partner wasn't an imposter. Chris told me of another incident that he had during one of his shifts. He said that he saw someone suspicious on camera in front of one of the offices way after working hours so he went to investigate. Halfway through, the partner radioed him and said he lost the person out of sight. It was strange though because apparently he only turned around for one second and the guy on the camera was gone. However, he said he thought he noticed a movement on the camera which overlooked the windows of the office from the outside. He said it was on the second floor. Chris decided to investigate it. 
As he's doing a sweep of the second floor, his partner radios him again halfway into his patrol and asks him if he had found anyone. Chris says no, asking him if he sees anything on camera. The partner first says no and then he pauses mid-sentence. Chris asks them to confirm what he said and the partner tells Chris that he should come back to the guardhouse. Chris wanted to finish the sweep, but the partner insisted he comes back to the guardhouse at once. Frustrated, he returned and asked him what was wrong. You really didn't see anyone in there, the partner asked. When Chris said no, the partner called him over to look at one of the camera feeds. He rewinds the footage to where he can see Chris in the window with the flashlight, and he tells him to pay close attention. Chris wasn't alone there. When his beam flashed across the window, it caught a silhouette staring at the camera. The next few seconds of the recording were spent by him talking to his partner on the radio, and in addition to the window silhouette, there was now a person standing directly behind him. As Chris moved through the room, more and more people became visible in the room, all staring directly at him, while he was completely oblivious to their presence. After that, he saw himself exiting the building, while the people in the building were disappearing, or more like blending in with the darkness. Now, overall, I've worked in various messed up places, but this one seems to be the most dangerous and aggressive one, with even HQ not being able to predict some of the things. There are more stories to share, but I'll post them another time. If any of you know of anyone who has similar experiences to mine as a security guard, chances are we work for the same company. I know a lot of you guys have been eager to see an update, but I've been too busy with work to update more frequently. I'll try to update more often. Anyway, here I am with some more stories from my company. The first story I'm going to tell you is about a big office building that our company has a contract with. I never personally worked there, but some of the guys I know did. One of the guards told me about the place in more detail. Apparently, it's a normal office building where people work a regular 9-to-5 job, but our guards need to be there 24-7. From around 8am until 6pm until all employees leave, it's pretty leisure. However, the guards and the employees have one very strict rule to follow. The building has no doors, including the one at the entrance. So at first glance, it looked really strange to see all these offices and bathrooms with naked door frames. After the employees leave, guards are to conduct patrols every hour until the end of the shift. They have to make sure all the door frames have no doors in them, and should they spot an actual door anywhere on the premise, they to make sure that it isn't closed. If the door was open or at least left slightly ajar, the guards would need to put one of those door holders on the ground to prevent the door from closing. The guards would carry a bunch of door holders on patrol just for this purpose. If the door was closed, however, they were ordered not to go near it under any circumstances. They also had a map of the building and had to memorize where each room was, making sure that the layout of the rooms was exactly how it was on the map including the direction on how the office desk and the furniture were facing. Now, the guard who told me this shared his own experience with me. He said that everything was calm for the first few months and then during one of his night shift patrols, he ran into a door on the second floor which was slightly ajar. He could see an office space behind the door and following the instructions, he pulled out his door holder and went to put it in front of the door. However, as he did so, he apparently had stumbled forward and actually pushed the door, which shot with a loud click. He swears that he couldn't have just fallen like that, so he firmly believes that something or someone somehow made him fall. And when he saw that he accidentally had shut the door, the guy panicked and decided to push everything under the rug by quickly opening the door, hoping that no one would notice. But he says that when he opened it, the office was no longer there. He was instead looking at the bathroom. He thought that he was in the wrong place at first because there was no way that the bathroom could even be there. So when he double checked, sure enough he was right. The office space he initially saw was supposed to be there. So he closed the door and opened it again. 
This time, he was staring at the kitchen. Fascinated by the whole thing, he kept closing and opening the door over and over, seeing all the different rooms from the building. He said that he would have gone on some more, but his partner radioed him to ask him how far he was in his sweep. The guy ended up closing and opening the door for a few more minutes until he finally saw that same office again. He placed the door holder on the floor and bolted back to the security room. He reported the appearance of the door to HQ, leaving out the details about closing and opening it. Everything was fine that night, but the following morning he was called by his boss, who asked him what the heck he was thinking closing the door like that. The guard was confused about how his boss even knew about it, and the boss told him that apparently some of the rooms had shifted around, and how the entire office building was completely jumbled up. No one was harmed and nothing really happened other than that, save for the only inconvenience being the workers having to make their trip from the third floor all the way down to the ground floor to use the bathroom. Me continued working there but never saw another door there again. One specific story which stands out for me is from a guard who was stationed as security in a residential house between 9pm and 4am. The owners, a married couple, lived there and they would leave the house every night at 8pm. And the guard who was appointed was told by the owners that the duties are fairly simple. HQ briefed the guard before he started working by giving him a list of rules to follow. Here's the transcript of the written rules. Duty starts at 9pm. However, make sure you're there at least an hour earlier. Before leaving your home for duty, take a sharp object and leave it inside your home near the exit. For instance, on the shoe stand. Any sharp object will do. However, the sharper the better. Preferably something that can easily puncture skin. If you can't make it at least 30 minutes before 9pm to the house where you perform your duty, inform HQ and skip your shift. Do not attempt to enter the house at or after 9pm under any circumstances. Once inside and the owners leave, follow these rules carefully. 9pm to 10pm. You can move freely throughout the house with the exception of entering the basement. 10pm to 11pm. Stay in the living room during this entire hour. Do not leave the room under any circumstances. Don't leave the house either. If you need to use the bathroom, use a bottle or any other means. 11 p.m. to 11.23 p.m. You will hear someone knocking on the window. Avoid looking at it. The knocking may become relentless and loud, but do not look at it. You may turn on the TV for distraction. 11.23 p.m. to 12 a.m. The knocking will have stopped by now, but you may now hear children crying upstairs. Ignore it. No children reside in the house. 12 a.m. to 12.25 a.m. You may now move freely around the first floor of the house, although it is advised you stay in the living room, the kitchen, and prepare for the next step. 12.25 a.m. to 12.30 a.m. Below the sink in the kitchen is a bucket full of fresh meat. Take it to the basement. You do not need to enter the basement. You can simply leave the bucket near the door inside, but make sure to close and lock the door again. A very important thing to note here. Make sure that you do not spill or drop any blood or meat from the bucket on the floor anywhere outside of the basement, since it can accurately smell blood up to a mile away. If you happen to spill any blood, do not bother cleaning. Simply follow the next step. 12.30 a.m. to 1 a.m. You may hear growling noises coming from the basement, but do not bother investigating. If you have previously spilled any blood around the house, do not bother cleaning up and instead sit on the couch. Turn on the TV and turn up the volume to the max. Cover your ears with your hands and keep your eyes firmly shut. Face the ground and stay in this position until 1am. If there is a pause on the TV for more than a few seconds, try to produce any loud sound of your own by screaming or speaking loudly to drown out any unnatural noises you may hear. 1 a.m. to 2 a.m. You may freely move throughout the entire house again, the basement excluded. This is the time to use for bathroom breaks. Do not attempt to leave the house. You should also use this time to memorize the room layouts, the furniture specifically. During this hour, you may hear a voice coming from the bedroom on the second floor, 
If you do, investigate. If there's a man in the room, lock the door and return to the living room immediately. Do not attempt to talk to the man. If the room is empty, you may continue to move freely. 2 a.m. to 3.33 a.m. Nothing major will happen during this hour here. Ignore any ringing on the phone and do not pick it up no matter how much it rings. 3.33 a.m. to 3.55 a.m. Now is the time to take stock of all the furniture in the house. If you see any extra furnishing, do not sit on it or touch it in any way. You will start to feel extremely sleepy by this point. Whatever you do, you must not fall asleep. It is recommended you spend this time in the kitchen and leave the sink water running, so you can splash your face whenever your eyelids become too heavy. 3.55 a.m. to 4 a.m. The owners will have returned by now. Before leaving, make sure to say aloud the sentence, My duty is finished. Not that if you do or do not do it upon entering into your home, you will find that you are back in the house of the owners. Should this be the case, then you only have one option. Take the sharp object you left close to the door and inflict mild damage to yourself. A minor stab in the forearm or the hand will do. If the house doesn't change to your own home, repeat the previous step until it does. May he quit just after one night. The last story that I'll share today is about a place that I was supposed to work in but luckily said no to. This was apparently a big lodge deep inside a forest in HQ. Had a ton of people waiting in line to work there. There were no duties there, no guarding, no paranormal rules, and nothing. So when I asked what the catch was, they said the guards could never leave the place until another one took over. When I laughed, the chief stared at me. He went on to explain that there had been cases of people wanting to quit in the middle of their shaft. But whenever they tried to... Something happens which prevents them from leaving. Either a huge storm, an accident, an injury, suddenly coming down with a fever severe enough to stop them from moving, etc. One guy even tried calling his friend to pick him up, but the friend ended up getting lost in the woods. Another guy tried leaving despite the thick snowstorm, but as he tracked through the snow, he ended up right back at the house. He claims that there is no way he could have been back there since he only went straight. And yet there he was. HQ has all these guards in line ready to take over. In case someone fails to show up for their own shift. And the guard who was previously there is stranded. And they still don't know how the lodge works or why anyone has to be there. But all they do know is that one person always has to be there. And the even stranger thing... No one in HQ knows how and when they signed a contract for this place. Whoever the client is, he's sending payments to the company every month and is impossible to track down. Well, that's it for now. I'll update you guys again in a few days since there's a bunch of more stories to share. One of the guards told me that he worked in a residential building. The building itself was normal, but in the basement of the building was a big round hole. No one knew how it got there and the residents said that they just woke up to find it there one day. The old lady who discovered it almost fell inside when she went to retrieve her bicycle. Various surveys and research teams were sent to investigate the hole but oddly enough, no equipment could determine where the bottom was. Electronics would either stop working at a certain depth, throwing something inside produced and no sound of impact, and chemical lights got swallowed by the darkness. They sent one crew member down there, but after about 10 minutes of descending, he stopped responding. They pulled him out as fast as they could, but he was gone. All that was left of him was the pile of clothes that he was wearing, still attached to the safety gear and the robes. The company was appointed to stand guard in front of the basement and not let anyone in. The guard who worked there, Andy, told me the job was pretty leisure most nights except that he was bored. And then one night, he heard something coming from inside the basement. It sounded like somebody calling his name. At first, he thought it was his imagination, but the more he listened, the more he became convinced it was his sister. And despite getting instructions from HQ not to go near the hole, mostly due to the possibility of a slipping and falling, Andy opened the door. Sure enough, there it was. 
his sister's voice calling him right from the hole a clear as day. He asked her how she got there and if she was okay, and she perkily said that everything was fine. She asked Andy to come down there so they could talk, and she talked in such a nonchalant way that Andy became suspicious of the whole situation. She asked him again to come down, and Andy refused, telling her that he would call help, to which his sister became increasingly agitated and angry. She demanded that he come down there and help her. Andy didn't budge, and his sister said that he would let her die there, just like he'd let their father die. Andy froze to this and his sister uttered a single sentence which made Andy run out of there. Andy, life is nothing but a pile of crap. Those were his father's last words before he took his own life in front of Andy. Andy bolted out of the building listening to his sister calling after him and begging him to come down. Andy called HQ telling him that he was never going back and he was assigned to a different post and never had a problem again. The really weird thing about this whole experience was that no one but Andy knew what his father's last words were. He never told anyone that he watched him turn the gun on himself and just stuck to the story that he found him dead. But the weirdest of all things was the fact that his sister had died in a tragic car accident four years before he ever saw that hole. The basement was locked tightly afterwards and guards continued working there, but they all reported the same thing. Voices of their loved ones calling from the hole and always asking the one same thing. To come down. The intervention guy whose story I shared in one of the earlier updates told me another one recently, which chilled me to the bone. He and his unit were stationed at a long since abandoned hotel, and they would get to do whatever they wanted in the hotel. But exactly 4.25 a.m., they had to assemble at the reception desk. Their job was to sweep the area for any suspicious activity. The guy who told me this said HQ never told them who or what they were looking for, but they were ordered to shoot on sight upon seeing anyone besides the unit members in the hotel. They had been sweeping the hotel for four nights in a row at exactly 4.30 a.m. until 5 a.m., but never found traces of anyone. And then on the fifth night, as they checked the second floor, the commander of the unit ordered them to stop and be quiet. There is a sound of muffled giggling coming from somewhere on the floor. Strangely though, as they listened, the giggling was always the same intonation and length of pause. Giggle, five seconds pause, a giggle, five seconds pause. He described it as an adult trying to impersonate a child's giggle. Carefully, the unit followed the sound to one of the rooms and as they stood in front of the door, the giggling became louder and more frequent. The unit burst inside the room and pointed their guns at the source of the sound. Facing the window was a tall person, except it wasn't a person. Here's how the guy who told me this described the creature. A very round face which contrasted its impossibly thin body. It had extremely long arms and legs and it was so inhumanly tall that... It had to hunch over and bend its knees in order to avoid touching the ceiling. It giggled again, and it still sounded muffled, just as it did behind a closed door. The unit stood there, with their guns pointed at this thing as the creature giggled once more, before going silent. And then it slowly started to turn around and locked eyes with the units. The creature apparently had a grinning toothy round face with large unblinking eyes. And this took the unit aback so much that they froze. It giggled again, but this time it was deeper and more guttural, albeit still muffled. Just then, the creature started running towards the unit, all the while giggling, louder and faster than ever. Everyone fired at will, practically emptying their clips into the thing. But luckily, the giggler, as he was later dubbed by the intervention unit, never managed to reach them and fell backwards as soon as the force of the bullets connected with it. As it lay there on the ground, it apparently kept giggling some more, but the sound became slower and more quiet, until it had completely stopped, leaving the creature dead with its grinning face and never changing. And the commander had informed HQ about this, who told them that their mission was complete and they had no longer needed to stay in the hotel, 
The intervention guy concluded that two of the unit members took their own lives within two months after the mission. In their farewell notes, they said that they could no longer stand to listen to the giggling at night. Recently, I was transferred to the operator's room in HQ. Essentially, I would sit in a room with a lady who served as backup for various guards who found themselves in situations they couldn't resolve. Most of these situations were your run-of-the-mill cases, where guards had drunks trespassing or being sure if they could investigate certain sounds and so on. There was only one call that I witnessed which stood out for me. It was late night and we had gotten a call from a guard who was stationed at a private farm. Whenever a call came through, I would put on the extra pair of headsets which would allow me to hear the conversation. Here's the transcript of the conversation. This is HQ, what's your situation? Uh, yeah, this is Mark from the Spencer Farm. There's a guy standing in front of the barn and I can see him on the camera. Alright. He's been standing there for two hours now. I first thought the camera was frozen, but when I zoomed in just now, I could see that his fingers are moving. He's tapping them nervously on his thigh and, oh, wait, his head seems to be twitching slightly. Well, is he armed? I can't see from here, he's facing away from the camera, but I don't see anything in his hands. He's standing on private property, you need to warn him to leave right away. Yeah, yeah, I'll do that right away. Stay on the call while you do it so you can tell me if you need backup. Five minutes later, we hear the guard's voice over the call again. Sir, 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 can you hear me? There is a moment of silence. What's going on over there? He isn't responding. He is just standing and twitching there. And his twitching is getting more and more violent. I think something's wrong with him. Get him off the property. Uh, sir, I'm going to have to ask you to. There was a loud scream coming from the guard. The operator pressed him to respond what was wrong, but the guard kept screaming and panting on the line, followed by the sound of frantic footsteps. There was a sound of a door violently shutting and shuffling, before the guard quieted down and tried to calm his breathing as much as he could. Mark, I need you to talk to me. What's going on? The guard's voice came through in a whisper. I can't talk. He's right outside. And by this point, I had already called the intervention unit who said they would arrive on the scene in 10 minutes. Mark, can you get somewhere safe? Backup will be there in 10, but I need you to hide. Can you do that? I'm, I'm inside the locker. He's standing just outside the security room. Something's wrong with his face. What do you mean? It's all wrong. It's like, it's sideways. His head is normal and all but his eyes. His nose and mouth are all flipped sideways. I, I think he's calling my name. Oh god, he's coming inside. There was a sound of a door slowly opening and then a set of slow and deliberate footsteps. Mark's breathing became stifled as he tried to steady it, probably putting a hand over his mouth. And then a voice came through, a raspy voice, which sounded as if the person on the other end had something stuck in their throat. Mark, it said. Mark's breathing suddenly became more violent and then he started screaming and begging for his life. The call ended and the operator and I stared at each other in disbelief. The intervention team arrived in the scene soon. There was no trace of Mark or the man that attacked him. The camera feed showed Mark approaching the man, who then turned around to face the guard and then Mark running back to the security room. From then, the man followed Mark to the security room, taking slow, unsteady steps, twitching along the way. He opened the locker where Mark had hid himself, and then the camera feed cut out. On the frames where the man was facing the camera, I could see his face clearly. It was exactly as Mark had described it, as if the man's face was rotated to the left by 90 degrees. A pair of eyes staring blankly sideways on top of one another, and a mouth which looked like a smile, but was instead just a crooked slit. Mike was never found again. 
My next story is going to be from another intervention unit member here. He was stationed at some experimental facility and didn't want to share any details about its location or nature of the experiment because, as he said, more than his job would be at stake. He spent about five months there with his unit and never saw any action. The regular security guards like me were taking care of the mundane problems like trespassers and so on. However, his unit regularly had drills in case of any emergency scenarios. He said the drills were not the typical military kind, but that there were some rules they needed to know, which pertained to not getting into any kind of physical contact with civilians. Their main objective in the worst case scenario was to seal off all exit points. Sure enough, one day an alarm sounds in the facility and he and his team get ready to start their mission. As they made their way through the facility, they ran into various scientists and other staff members that were deceased. And then they ran into a survivor, a researcher all bloody and scared. He raised his hands and begged them not to shoot, while the units just kept barking orders at him to keep his distance. The researcher kept saying that he's not infected, whatever that meant. And as he stood there eyeing everyone, all of a sudden he snarled showing rows of sharp teeth which were not there a second ago. And then he lunged forward, tackling one unit member and sneaking his teeth into his face. The guy told me they started shooting long before he even lunged, but it was as if the researcher didn't even react to the bullets. He was riddled with holes and he bled, but just kept biting and biting until he finally fell over. He tried to jump again, but died a second later. The unit members emptied their clips into the now dead scientist and proceeded to leave the facility, leaving their one team member behind. Once they had secured the facility and locked every exit point, locking the potential survivors inside, they contacted HQ and a bunch of armored vehicles with military personnel and hazmat suits showed up. The unit was dismissed from the facility and warned to not talk about any sensitive details related to the experiment the names of staff members, and so on. No matter how much I pressed him, he refused to tell me more. The final story in this post, which I'm going to share, is from a guard named Tom, who worked in an office building. Before he got sent to work, HQ gave him a one-week training. He was strictly forbidden from talking or making any kind of vocal sounds while working in the office. Communication with his partner by talking was forbidden, too. So, they used hand signals. Upon arriving on his first day, Tom saw people doing their everyday jobs at their desks, just typing away but never talking. They wouldn't even look at him, but would instead stare at their screens all day. Tom followed HQ's instructions and conducted his duties, not talking to anyone. But one day, he brought his cell to work because he was bored. As he made his way through the office, someone started calling him and the song which was set at his caller tone blared in the office. He quickly turned it off but then realized something terrible. All eyes in the office were fixed on him. The people had stopped typing and working and just stared at Tom with an expressionless face. Tom mumbled, crap, to himself. And everyone in the office unanimously said the same thing in a synchronized tone. Tom slowly made his way out and as he went through the hallway, he saw through the glass the people were still staring at him. Not only them though, but everyone else in the office stared at Tom as well. He locked himself in the security room along with the partner and eventually the people returned to their normal, talkless work. The next day, Tom was fired for bringing his phone to work and potentially putting himself and his partner in danger. He said it's a good thing too because he had planned on quitting. It's been a while since my last update, so I apologize for that. I've been busy with work lately and have been unable to post here. With that in mind, I have some good stories to share for today. One of the guys from my company named Gary was outsourced to a small secretive organization for a short project. The details of the project were undisclosed. But the guard who volunteered for this job had to stay in a remote facility close to a small town for one month. Now, the organization was pretty shady, since they had military personnel guarding the facility and scientists running around. 
which raised the question of whether a guard was even needed there. Immediately upon arrival, the superiors explained his duties to me. The guard was free to do anything he wanted all day, but once a day at lunchtime, he would need to distribute mint candy to everyone in the facility and make sure that they ate it, everyone including himself. He was to make sure the mint was ingested by inspecting each individual's mouth upon swallowing. Anyone who refused was to be reported to these superiors. Gary laughed at this initially, but when the superiors assured him that this task is of the utmost importance, he knew better than to screw around. Gary followed the rules and made sure to have everyone eat mint every day, which caused him to be shunned by the project participants, since no one knew why they had to do it. Towards the end of the project, however, some people started complaining about frequent headaches. Those same people were later exposed as ones who didn't ingest the mint properly. They were detained for insubordination. Something else happened in the meantime, however, and the company lost contact with the facility. Among all people, Gary managed to contact the company with a simple text message that said, Something's wrong. Send help now. An intervention unit was dispatched right away, but it would be three days until they reached the remote area. Before they did, however, HQ continued to try to contact Gary in the facility, asking what had happened. After days of radio silence, they only got one short text. Everything okay. When the intervention unit arrived, everyone at the facility was dead, and details were undisclosed. There was a security guard in our company who primarily worked as a driver. His job was to transport to company-related equipment like weapons, cameras, uniforms, etc. from one facility to another. Now this sounds like a normal day-to-day -day job, right? Wrong. As the driver, he took a route which went via an old road and saved a lot of time, but he had a bunch of rules that he had to follow. Before he was hired, he had a simulation of the drive in order to see if he could follow all the rules. Here are the rules, as listed by HQ below. Start driving at exactly 9pm when the alarm in the vehicle goes off, not a minute sooner, not a minute later. Keep all doors locked at all times and keep your seatbelt off for a quicker exit in case of an emergency. The road is straightforward and there are no turns. So, if you see a forking in the road, turn your vehicle around immediately and go back to HQ. Do not stop for any hitchhikers under any circumstances, even if they are in fatal trouble. If you see headlights suddenly appearing behind you, speed up. Ignore any sounds from the back of the vehicle. You may hear headbanging, growling, or clattering. Don't stare at the rearview mirror for longer than three seconds at a time. If you see something running along with your vehicle on the side of the road, ignore it no matter how close it is and speed up. It should disappear within five minutes. If your vehicle's engine suddenly dies, close your eyes and try to stay calm and start the engine again. Ignore any tapping on the windows and do not look at them. Once you go over the yellow line in the road, which is 24 miles from the starting point, you're in the clear. And despite seeing all of this in the past few years of his work, he says that he wouldn't trade his job for anything in the world. A guy named Ethan told me about his experience working in the morgue. Now, working in a morgue is as bad enough as it is, but working in one outsourced to my company is even worse. His job was to take over once the staff were done there at 10pm, and just to make sure that no one got in or out. He quit after only a month due to the mental stress that he experienced during his time there. He says the company allowed him to do whatever he wanted there, including sleep. However, it wasn't advised and you'll understand why in a moment. Ethan said that on a good night, he would hear people screaming from the body chambers begging to be let out and that they were placed there by mistake. While there was no strict rule about opening the chambers, it would probably be nerve-wracking to do so. The problem, however, was that once the bodies started screaming, the only way to stop them was to pull out the chamber. Immediately upon coming into view, 
Ethan would be faced with a cold, dead, unmoving body, and silence would return to the room. He said that often when reading something or getting sleepy, he'd feel a strong grip on his shoulder or hear a loud boo in his ear. There would never be anything around though, but you can see why sleeping there would be impossible. He would often see a body chamber pulled on on his way back from the bathroom, and if that were the case, his job was to push it back in immediately. There were some other rules, but all in all, what made him quit was the man in a lab coat that he constantly kept seeing in the morgue. The company told him to never address the man, since no workers were there after 10pm. Ethan made the mistake of talking to him on his first shift, and then every subsequent night, the man would silently follow him, always at the same distance and never talking, just staring. Another guard who worked in a factory complex with a partner told me a story. He said that he had been working there for about two months before things got weird. At the start of each shift, he would meet up with his partner and they would take turns patrolling. The first month, his partner kept complaining of severe insomnia and fatigue. And then one day, he just came to work completely fresh. The guy who told me the story said he jokingly told his partner that he may have been looking at another person with such a sudden change. That working area was pretty desolate, and HQ would rarely contact them. They would just have them submit weekly reports and that's it. But two months after this guy starts working there, HQ contacted the guy and told him to bear working alone for just a few more nights, since there was a new guard on the way. And the guy asked, What do you mean just a few more nights? I already have a partner here. HQ went silent for a moment before saying that his partner was found dead at his home a month ago. As soon as they told him that, as if on cue, he stopped seeing his partner altogether. He said that he saw a change of at least five more guards in the following year. One veteran guard told me about the time that he spent guarding a mansion. The mansion itself supposedly belonged to a late rich man and his family who was trying to sell the place but apparently no one wanted it, even though it was practically dirt cheap. The guy who told me the story had been there for almost a year before he had got a new partner, a rookie who had just joined the company. Apparently there were no rules or anything like that, except for one. Don't open any doors. Well, long story short, the rookie messed up. During the patrol on the second floor, he heard a little girl crying. Now, I don't know if he stopped to think rationally for a moment, or if his hero instincts had kicked in, but he decided to check it out, just a quick peek. The sobbing was coming from one of the rooms on the left, so carefully and quietly, he turned the knob and he opened the door. As soon as he did, the crying stopped. Not like somebody had heard him and then stopped crying, no. It was like somebody had pressed a mute button right in the middle. Anyway, he poked his head in and saw nothing, so he went back to his patrol. Not a minute later, he hears the crying again, once more from the left but a different room. He checks it out again and once more the crying stops. He continues his patrol and just then realizes that the corridor is on loop. He continues walking through hoping that it's just a really long corridor, but every dozen steps or so that he takes... The crying follows him in one of the rooms on the left. He tries running back, but again, there's crying on the left and the corridor goes on for much longer than he remembers walking. He continues, fully aware that he should have been out by now, but the exit is nowhere in sight. He was now in a full-blown panic, so he contacted his partner via radio, telling him that he messed up. When the veteran asked him how and the rookie told him that the corridor is on a loop, the only thing the veteran guard was able to mutter was, Oh crap. A moment of silence ensued before the veteran said, You opened the door, didn't you? I told you not to open any doors. What the heck were you thinking? Alright, listen, just walk forward. Don't run, just walk. And don't turn around at any sounds behind you. Just keep walking, you got it? Just pretend that you're on patrol and ignore anything you see or hear. But if you see the crying girl in front of you, you turn around and you run for your life. You got it? 
The next few minutes were a mixture of deadly silence and eager anticipation. And ten minutes later, though, the rookie stumbles into the security room, pale as a sheet of paper but alive. He was unable to speak properly due to the trauma, but was uninjured. The veteran called the medical team and they escorted the rookie out of there. He never came back to that place again. Whether he was fired or decided to quit, we never found out. Back when I worked in one of the office buildings that our company guards, I had a partner on duty who would help me in my patrols, since the building was too big. Usually, we would divide patrols with one of us starting from the top floor and moving down, and the other guard going from the bottom up until we met on floor number 10. To make things interesting, we made it like a race. So this one time, I started from the bottom and made my way up, and met my partner on the ninth floor. At first, I found it odd that he was on this floor, when we always met on floor 10. He said that he had got tired of waiting downstairs and decided to make his way down and to do my work for me. I found it odd that he had got there so quickly, since he would usually take his time checking every nook and cranny, but dismissed it as unimportant. There was something else off here though, but I couldn't put my finger on it. All I know is that I suddenly got a really bad feeling and that the hairs on the back of my neck stood straight. Again, I dismissed it as my imagination. He suggested that we return downstairs and head outside so that he could have a quick smoke. I told him that we were forbidden from doing so, but he said that he would be quick, two minutes tops. When we were about to make our way down when I heard a voice shot from upstairs. Heck yeah, I beat you to it. We're running late tonight, are we? It was my partner's voice. I stared at my partner in front of me who looked equally scared and begged me not to go there and that the voice was fake. It was then that I realized what was so wrong with the person in front of me. He had completely black eyes. Now I remember thinking how the heck I didn't notice that before and I bolted upstairs to floor 10. My partner was there, visibly confused by my state. I explained what happened, and when we went downstairs, the imposter was gone. We spoke to HQ about it a bit later, and here's what the chief said. You ever heard of those black-eyed kids? My partner and I shook our heads, and the chief continued. Well, apparently there are these kids with black eyes that knock on your door and ask you to let them in. You're not in any danger so long as you decline their invitation. Now, there have been sightings in that building of black-eyed adults. They usually ask you to go outside with them, so our assumption is that they want to get out, but they can't do it without permission or an escort. That's why you're not allowed outside during your shift. So, what if we let them out? I asked. Don't, is all the chief said. Another place my company has a contract with is a big botanical garden. Four guards work there in shifts and the rules were simple. Carry a flamethrower with you and kill anything found on the trails. That includes squatters, stray animals, etc. But the biggest concern were the plants. The guards were told that if they so much as hear something or see a stray root or branch on the trail, unleash hell until everything is sterile again. Each section of plants was separated in a way that flames couldn't spread. This story was shared to me by one of the former guards who retired recently. He said that he had spent about 10 years working there and had seen all sorts of strange things, but most commonly he would just have to burn the plants that have grown over the trail. He said that often he would see a tiny piece of root sticking towards the trail, and two hours later on his patrol, overgrown and green tendrils would cover the place. He said the tendrils would writhe when burned, and there would be a hiss of some sorts that sounded like the plant was screaming in pain. He ended his career on one day, a stray tendril wrapped itself around his ankle and started dragging him off the trail. He had managed to burn the tendril off, but a sharp thorn had found itself in his foot. He plucked it out and continued working, but the following day, he had bulging veins all over his foot. Upon closer inspection, he realized those weren't veins, but tiny tendrils emerging from the wound where the thorn had pricked him and slowly growing and reaching higher. First, towards his ankle and then knee. 
Meandad was foot amputated and retired after that with a handsome compensation. When I asked him if he regretted working there, he said that he would give both his feet for this job without a second thought. This story is from one of the intervention members and is related to the story of one of those black-eyed people that I had mentioned earlier. The guy who told me this is known to others simply as Survivor. Apparently, he's been on dozens of missions and saw a change of four full teams, being the sole survivor on the squad of every mission. When I met him, he turned out not to be the burly, bald, scar-ridden tough guy that I had imagined. Instead, he looked like your average Joe. Athletic build, kind eyes, approachable personality. He lit a cigarette as he told me his story. I heard you met one of those black-eyed people a while ago. Good thing you didn't make the same mistake that one guard made a few years back and let them out. They're nasty when they get off their leashes. So about that story. A few years back, we get a call from HQ to immediately go to the site where you worked and investigate. When we got there, the higher-ups were already there, questioning the guard. More like interrogating. The guard was in a panicked state, rambling about his partner having black eyes. His partner was right there, though, and was just as confused as we were. From his incoherent speech, we figured that the black-eyed entity, who had posed as his partner, suggested they go out for a quick whiff of fresh air. The guard agreed, even though he had had a bad feeling the whole time. See, that's the one thing that happens often with these black-eyed people. You get a terrible nagging feeling, but you just can't figure out why or what it is. You also don't realize that they have black eyes for some reason until it's too late. So apparently they went out and the black-eyed man just smiled and thanked the guard for escorting them to the exit before walking away. The rules were never to go out during shift of course, so... The guard was put into disciplinary and we were sent to go after the escaped entity. Just an hour later, we got intel that he was in a nearby motel. This was bad for us because what happens is, those things feed on other people. And I don't mean kill them. They do something to you, suck the life out of you and get stronger, while you live out the rest of your days as a vegetable. And we hoped that the thing hadn't attacked anyone before we had arrived. The receptionist was just as panicked as the guard and called the cops, so that's how the company found the target. We evacuated everyone under the excuse that there is a dangerous criminal in one of the rooms and we went upstairs. The negotiator knocked on the door, presenting himself as an employee of the motel and asking him to open the door. But you see, the thing is... These guys are not so dangerous if you can get them to open the door willingly. But if they don't, well, let's just say that sending an armored vehicle against them still poses a threat to the driver. So anyway, the guy on the other side of the door answers, asking who it is. He sounds like a normal human male, nothing suspicious, but after a moment of debating decides that he wants to be left alone. He was probably suspicious and he knew that someone would go after him. Anyway, the negotiator steps back. We break the door down forcefully and throw in a tear gas grenade. The tear gas itself is so strong that no one could take even a whiff of it without being affected. Heck, one of my former unit members had a faulty gas mask and started vomiting just two seconds in. But not the black-eyed people. We burst inside, pointing guns at the guy who looked exactly like the guard that we saw earlier, save for the black eyes. As he's just standing there, staring at us through the gas, bemused and unaffected, black eyes reflecting from our flashlights. Without thinking, we open fire, and he flinches as the bullets pierce his body, but he continues standing. And then he opens his mouth, so wildly that his jaw and hinges and his lips tear at the edges all the way to the ears. All of a sudden, instead of human teeth, there's a row of spikes and some spin these spider-like appendages that grow out of its back with a loud, bone-cracking and gurgling sound. We keep firing, but the thing impales our men one by one with those spider legs. In seconds, only two of us remained, and the thing grabbed the other guy and bit his head off whole, like it was no more than a piece of tender meat. Somehow, I found myself in the ground and without ammo, so I pulled out my pistol and held it trained to the thing. 
and I didn't want to shoot. Somehow I thought that would only anger it. It turned towards me and got so close that the nuzzle of my gun was touching its forehead. It drooled all over me. Saliva and blood mixed in its mouth and I remember recognizing malice and hunger in its eyes as it stared at me like I was its next meal. I remember contemplating turning the gun on myself before it could do whatever it wanted to me. And then more gunshots. From the armored guys and the thing jumped out the window. I quickly got up when the guys stopped shooting and went for the window. But it was already on the other side of the street. Scurrying with its spider legs so quickly that I thought to myself, Holy crap, I'm lucky to be alive. The commander of the armored unit simply approached me and said, Surprise, surprise, Survivor survives again. The black-eyed creature was located weeks later in a remote village where it had been killing its people one by one in secret, only getting stronger. The team that was dispatched to kill it was ordered to keep things quiet, but I doubt that was the case with all the explosives and firepower that they used. They practically had to use anti-tank missiles to kill it. Anyway, they finally did take the thing out, but not before it took down two more of our men. And that's that. He finished his sig by now, so he lit another one. I remember being amazed at how calm he was, talking about his near-death experience at the hands of this monster. Uh, do any of your experiences from past missions ever haunt you? I asked. He shook his head. Nah, if you let it get to you in this line of work, you don't last for long. A new recruit joined our company recently and was stationed at a park for a while. The place was rarely traversed by people even during daytime, due to dangerous trails and stories about the place being haunted. The rookie told me about his time there and while on most nights he said he would see nothing, there were occasions where he would poop his pants. For instance, when patrolling, it was a common rule that guards should never walk off trail. The rookie said the first time something happened it was like this. He was walking on the trail and it was all quiet, when he heard bare footsteps on crunchy leaves in the dark. He stopped and pointed his flashlight, but nothing was there. He took a few more steps and again, more footsteps and the sound of leaves shuffling came from behind him. He turned around again and saw nothing yet again. But then as he moved his flashlight to the right, he saw something that looked like an emaciated man with no clothing running just out of reach of the torch beam, disappearing into the dark again. This would happen every time his torch would get in contact with someone. For a split second, he would see a nude person before they ran off, too fast to be tracked or to get a better look. The rookie continued patrolling on edge and ready to shoot. When he heard the footsteps again, he turned around and managed to illuminate one of those people. Except this time... The person that he illuminated didn't move and instead peeked from behind a tree, as if playing hide-and-seek. He recognized that this was a woman with long, greasy hair and baggy eyes. He looked like he had been in the wilderness without food and water for a while, and was on the verge of dying. They stared at each other for a while and then she opened her mouth and started screaming, except it wasn't really screaming but more of a croaking sound as if the woman had lost her voice. The rookie fired a few shots and started running, and the croaking followed him for a good five minutes, never going quieter or louder. He said it was as if she was maintaining the same distance from him the entire time. She didn't stop even once to breathe in during this entire time, but instead just continued croaking continuously. Just before he had reached the guardhouse, the croaking was heard right in his ear before it stopped completely. The emaciated people were gone and he was safe. The rest of the night was quiet. Although I can see it troubles him, he seems determined to continue working. He was transferred from the place recently, so now he works in a more relaxing environment, if you could call it that. From time to time, he wakes up at night when he hears a loud croaking in his ear. He says, but he finds no one around. Now there used to be a guard who worked in a factory. There were no exceptional rules except don't let anyone in without an ID and don't go inside of the working grounds unless absolutely necessary. 
The guy described these shifts as being completely peaceful, with no strange occurrences. He worked there for about three months when a factory worker came to him asking to see the boss. The guard obviously didn't know who the boss was, though. He asked the employee's section and went to look for his superior there. Except when he opened the door, nothing was there. Literally no people or machines were inside. The interesting thing, though, was the fact that the noise of the machines were so loud that he couldn't hear anything else. When he looked up at the ceiling, his jaw dropped to the floor. Up there on the ceiling, upside down, were people working on their daily duties on the conveyor belts, on the machines, etc. The guard jerked his head up and down, thinking it was a mirror or an optical illusion. But that wasn't the case, because he couldn't see his own reflection anywhere, nor the machines or people on the floor where he was. It was just then that he realized that the floor he was standing on wasn't a floor at all. It was a ceiling, and neon lights were hanging from the floor up. The guard suddenly felt dizzy. He described it as staring down from a very tall building. And then he got out of there, not sure what he had just seen. He told the worker that he couldn't find his boss and told him to wait for him or find him himself. And everything went down normally from there. The superior came and went, etc. The guard continued working and is still there, as far as I'm aware. There was another guard who worked in an orphanage. On a daily basis, working in one would take a mental toll on its staff members. So you can imagine why no one wanted to fill the spot when HQ gave information of a vacant position there. The guard who had gotten the job there had been jobless for a while and was aware of the potential risk, but was in desperate need for a job. The rules were simple. Stay on the orphanage grounds and let the caretakers do the job. At 9 a.m. every morning, the orphans would all gather in a big room. From there, the guards had to put on thermal goggles and inspect everyone. If any of them didn't emit any heat while the goggles were on, in other words, if the goggles showed the orphan being devoid of the colors would show at a bodily temperature, they were supposed to be disposed of on site. The guard said everything was fine for a while and then one day he saw something wrong with one of the orphans. All the others were shown as yellow, red and green with the thermals, whereas this boy was completely colorless. The guard was caught off guard, no pun intended, and instead of following direct orders to just take the kid out, he informed his partner. When the partner double checked, he immediately pointed his weapon and did what he had to do to the kid. There was widespread panic as the other kids ran around and the caretakers tried calming them down. The partner scolded the guard for not shooting right away. The guard told me that he had started to feel sick witnessing a child get taken out right in front of him. Until the next thing that happened. The kid who was targeted started writhing on the ground and producing this high-pitched scream that sounded like a rat being burned. The guard described the kid literally melting until all that was left of him was a steaming red and gooey substance on the ground. The guard asked what that was and his partner explained. He first showed him some pictures of kids, except they weren't kids. They had completely white eyes, pale skin covered in purple veins and sharp teeth. Some of them were slightly creepier, with elongated necks, emaciated extremities, or unnaturally hunched backs. Apparently, these creatures find their way into the orphanage, taking the appearances of normal children and patiently wait for a naive family to adopt them. In most cases, when that happens, the parents are usually found tragically dead sometime later, and the kid is placed back into the orphanage for a new family. It's unknown how widespread those creatures are, but one thing is for sure, this isn't the only orphanage where they were spotted. For Christmas, all the guards in the office where I work at accept intervention get a day off. Doesn't matter what shift you're doing, but by 5pm on the 24th, you need to be out of the office. One of the guards offered to stay one year, stating that he and his wife were in a fight, and he didn't mind doing a little bit of overtime. HQ wouldn't even hear about it, and threatened to fire him if he was found on grounds after the aforementioned time. I figured it was just their way of saving up some money, and since intervention is basically always on rotation, it made logical sense to me. 
Nah, it wasn't until an intervention member told what was really going on that I got the bigger picture. Here's what he told me. Christmas is supposed to be a really happy time for everyone. You go home, spend time with your family, that sort of thing. But over here, it's one of the worst days of the year. Intervention members are fighting over each other's so who's going to take paid time off for Christmas Eve. I don't blame them. They know what comes for Christmas and it terrifies them. He took a long pause, staring into nothingness, as if remembering something before continuing. They put four units of intervention in the office for Christmas Eve. It's crazy, huh? We usually have just one unit, and that's only in case of emergency. But for Christmas, something strange comes around. The first time that I saw it four years ago, and back then we only had one unit stationed. It was my first year in the unit as we were sitting there in the comms room. Everyone seemed on edge, and glanced at the clock every few minutes. I didn't understand it, but figured they were just irritated that they weren't with their families. 11.50pm uh, comes and the unit leader says simply, Let's move. I didn't know what this was about, so I just followed my squad. You know that building that you're never supposed to enter, no matter what you see? Well, we went inside there and the leader led us straight into one of these staff resting rooms, which had a huge fireplace in it. Before I knew what was going on, everybody's pointing their guns at the fireplace and the squad leader looks at me and tells me to shoot as soon as I see something. I was a little nervous to say the least, but I followed my orders and I tried to stay calm. In this line of work, if you lose your cool for even a second, you're a dead man. So anyway, we waited with our guns trained in the fireplace. Everyone was silent at first and I heard my watch beep to indicate that it was midnight and as if on cue. I heard it. Some kind of noise coming from above. I thought it was coming from the ceiling and I pointed my gun up. But the commander yelled at me to keep my gun pointed at the fireplace. The scratching from above got louder. As if whatever was there was going down the chimney. And then there was something that sounded like a thud. Right from inside the fireplace. And then I heard something that still chills me to my bone whenever I remember it. You know how Santa has his trademark? Ho, 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 laughter. Well, we heard that, but a very slow ho, ho, ho. Except it didn't sound human. It sounded as if there were five people saying it at the same time, all with different tones but perfectly synchronized. And we heard another thud, before another demonic ho, ho, ho. And then a hand came out from inside the fireplace, a skinny, pale, wrinkled-up hand, which grabbed at the side of the fireplace, as if to get a better grab. You could clearly see that this thing wore Santa's clothing, but the sleeves seemed old and dirty. I saw something that looked like additional fingers coming out of his wrist, but they weren't moving like the ones on his hand. It all happened so fast, but as soon as the hand appeared, everybody started shooting. In a second or so, the creature impersonating Santa popped out for a split second, and I saw a shriveled, a pale creature with a dirty gray beard and red eyes. I thought that it was my imagination, but I was later able to confirm that this thing had dozens of limp hands, just sticking out of various parts of its body, sometimes as full-grown arms. Anyway, in that split second... Santa grabbed one of our members in a big, blood-stained bag and just like that, disappeared back into the fireplace. The commander gave us the order to cease fire and so we did, and we listened as our bagged teammate screamed in horror while Santa dragged him through the chimney. Before he left, he gave us one final mocking ho-ho-ho, leaving us in complete silence. We never saw a teammate again. Year after year, this thing has been coming back on Christmas Eve and HQ has tried various methods to stop it. Automated turrets, traps, you name it. One year, they even put clasps on the floor to hold the unit members from being snatched away. The guy who got bagged that year, the only thing left of him were his feet, still stuck to the floor. Why don't we just leave it be, you may ask? Well, if we do... This thing will get out and bag someone else instead. 
Someone suggested once to just leave some lowlife scum from prison as tribute every Christmas to this creature. So they may start doing that starting this year. And if they can pull the right strings. But one thing is for sure though. It always comes back and each time it does, it has more hands coming out of its body. There was a place where I was stationed for two months which served as a warehouse of some sort. Now the warehouse itself was made for mannequins and simply consisted of one big room, filled with hundreds of mannequins which were no longer in use. I was to work alone there in the shift, so the senior guard who was about to retire took me for a tour around the place. He gave me a flashlight and he told me to follow him. Now, going through a room full of mannequins at night is creepy enough as it is, but with the quirks that come with our company it's even worse. The warehouse itself was so crammed with mannequins that there were makeshift aisles between them, specifically made so that guards could take them as patrolling roads. Get your gun ready and keep the safety off, the senior guard told me. It immediately put me on edge, but he seemed pretty calm and he had been working there for the past six years, so I figured he knew what he was doing. This can be a nasty place if you're not careful, he said. One slip up and you're done for. Tell me, what do you see with your flashlight? I scanned the row of mannequins, checking each one of them out carefully. Some were missing heads, others were missing arms or hands, or they were just dirty and overused. Other than that, they seemed like normal mannequins. Nothing, I said. Yep, press the button on the back of your flashlight, the senior guard said. I did as he had ordered and instead of the regular light, my flashlight started emitting a black light. He told me to scan the area again. I slowly moved my flashlight from left to right, illuminating the mannequins with purple light. Everything seemed normal at first, but then my heart jumped in at my throat when I stopped the light on one female mannequin, which seemed different. It was in a regular standing position with one hand up, as if explaining something, but that wasn't the odd thing. The mannequin wasn't really a mannequin. The crude body shape and these separations between joints which make a mannequin distinct were gone. And I was instead looking at a realistic human woman in old, tattered clothing. As soon as the black light had reached her face, she shielded her eyes and then started screaming like a banshee, showing off rows of sharp teeth. I pointed my gun at the thing, but before I could fire her, the senior guard had already put a bullet between the woman's eyes. Instantly, her head fell off, and I was once again looking at a motionless mannequin. She was still in her screaming position, with arms and legs spread, but her head was gone, as it had rolled somewhere in the background. Like I said, a nasty place, he said. Always use your blacklight and check every one of them. They're really sneaky. You see that one there? He pointed his flashlight towards one male mannequin among the crowd, which was in the company's security uniform and missing an arm. That was George, the guy who worked here before me, he said. What? I asked. Well, apparently he got a little drunk before the shift and when I arrived, he was like this. On the floor, all mannequinized, missing an arm. There were a few other mannequins around him and a position that suggested he was ambushed and killed by them. We are strictly forbidden from touching or moving any of them, so there's no way he managed to put them in there in such an elaborate position, especially given the fact that he was so wasted. Anything else that I should know? I asked. Yeah, of course, if you hear footsteps somewhere, it means that you may have missed one of them and now it's trying to ambush you. It's really important that you retrace your steps if that happens and find out where it's hiding. It's never going to move in plain sight, unless you point the black light at it. You may hear footsteps and as soon as you turn around, everything will be still and quiet. You'll look at the mannequins, sure that you saw them in different positions and postures a minute ago, or they'll seem closer to you, but you won't be able to put your finger on it. In that case, it's better to be safe than sorry. Go back, check them all out once more, and shoot the one that looks human. Just one bullet in the torso ahead, and your choice. They're pretty fragile. 
And we had issued three more mannequins by the end of the sweep, and once we were done, he said, Oh, and they may sometimes beg you to spare them, pretend that they don't know how they got there, and so on. If they do, that it means they're trying to distract you and another one may be sneaking up on you. In that case, it's best to shoot the thing and run to the nearest corner. From there, slowly scan the area once more. Again, one slip up and you're done for. But luckily, you only need to do one sweep per night. Are there always mannequins to shoot? He nodded. And the best I got so far was two in a night. The worst, I can't count. One guy from the company works in a zoo of some sorts, but as far as I'm aware, it isn't a zoo which is open to the public. His primary job is to feed the animals once a night and make sure all the cages and enclosures were secure along the way. Here's the thing. He never saw the animals there, because the cages were covered on all sides, making it impossible to peer inside. The guard would carry a bucket full of meat, some of it rotten, and he carried around a piece of paper which said which meat goes into which cage. For one cage, however, he had to take a live, a sedated pig and lead it to a slide, which dropped directly into the cage. He described it just seconds after the pig was delivered. You would hear a deep growl and the pig screaming in agony. Loud sounds of crunching bones and rapid flesh chewing came from inside the cage for a few minutes after that. The pig would stop screaming within the first minute. The second strict rule he has to follow is to patrol the area three times during the night and make sure all locks are secured tightly, calling the repairman for replacement if they so much as had their paint scratched. If he was to see any external damage on the cages, like broken bars, busted walls, etc., he was to remain as still as possible and just move his hand enough to radio HQ by uttering the code 1098. He was to remain as still as possible until the intervention unit arrived and escorted him out of there. He never got into that situation though, but he did feel on edge the first few shifts, because he would often hear growling, thrashing, and banging on the bars. Despite not being able to see them, he was sure the animals knew exactly where he was at all times, because he could hear them following him alongside the cage when he patrolled. He also said that he would often have armored units arrive in APCs, armed to the teeth, escorting something out in a cage so secure that C4 couldn't get through it. They'd place the animal in its enclosure and leave the place without a word. I asked him what exactly was being guarded there, and he shrugged, saying, Well, I can tell you one thing for sure. Whatever it is, it's no freaking cougar. A guard by the name of Michael used to work in an abandoned hotel. There were three other guards on the shift with him, each guard covering one floor. They had radios to keep each other company and generally nothing ever happened in the hotel. Michael told me about the night when he decided to quit the job in the middle of a shift. It was around 2am in the morning and he was patrolling around the second floor checking each room. The rule was that if they found anyone or anything in any of the rooms or even heard any noise. They were to go back to the reception and call the intervention unit. So anyway, Michael went about his patrol normally, when he suddenly heard a noise coming from the bathroom in room 204. He radioed it into his co-workers, but no one responded. He tried multiple times, but it was as if the line was dead. Not wanting to go all the way back to the reception and being curious about the noise, he slowly approached and opened the bathroom. He saw one of the guards there standing in front of the mirror, guard Sean from floor 3 to be precise. Michael asked him if he's okay but Sean just stood there, staring at the mirror in what Michael described as twitching his shoulder and his head from time to time. When Michael grabbed him by the shoulder, Sean turned around and made his co-workers scream in horror. Apparently, Sean's face was completely distorted as if his skin was stretched to the side of his face. Michael said that it looked like Sean was wearing a leather mask, which he failed to put on his face properly, and it was just sitting there sideways. Sean had staggered towards Michael with an outreached arm, muttering something incoherent in a muffled tone, since his mouth was practically where his cheek was, revealing the sides of his teeth. Michael ran out of there, 
slamming the door to 204 shut and tumbling down the stairs to the reception. When he got there, he tried to radio in his coworkers again, but only got a muffled groan as a response over the radio. He panicked and picked up the phone to call intervention, when the door suddenly burst open, and two of his coworkers were there, laughing their butts off. Michael asked them what was so funny, and they said it was all just a big prank to scare him. He put the phone down and breathed a sigh of relief. He didn't get angry and even commended them on a job well done putting such a realistic mask on Sean. This is when his two co-workers gave each other a weird glare. When Michael asked them what was wrong, one of them simply said, Sean wasn't in on our prank. It was then that they realized that Sean was unresponsive on the radio. Michael described being in sort of a trance from that moment. He doesn't clearly remember it. But his co-workers tried radioing Sean and when he didn't respond... They called the intervention unit. The unit went to investigate and after hearing gunshots coming from on the second floor, Michael simply left the company belongings on the counter of the reception and left through the front door, never to come back again. I hope you all enjoyed the variety of stories I've had since my time working for the company. I may update you later, but for now, this is all. Stay safe out there. That'll do it for this week's stories. I hope that you enjoyed. Thank you guys so much for your continued support on this podcast. It means a lot to me. And I would be remiss to not thank these sponsors of today's podcast as well. Coinbase. For a limited time, new users can get $10 in free Bitcoin when you sign up today at coinbase.com slash mrcreeves. And Green Chef. Go to greenchef.com slash mrcreeps130 and use code mrcreeps130 to get $130 off plus free shipping. I hope that your guys' march is going well. Make sure to sit down, relax, and catch some basketball games or maybe a golf tournament if you're into that sort of thing. I hope to see you guys here next week as well and as always, remember, stay creepy.